It's just you and me tonight, Can. What kind of hell are we gonna raise? Barbarian, magician, thief, cavalier, and acrobat. If some wizard was handing out magic rolls and I got stuck with acrobat, I'd be so pissed. What am I gonna do with that? Jump off a bridge? Oh, what the goddamn. Come to the plains! Are you bored of walking outside into a meaningless, uncaring world full of traffic and making eye contact with people? Come to the plains! Rid yourself of earthly possessions and take a plane ride to the plains! That's right, get in a plane, fly through a portal, and come out who knows where! Could this be the start of your epic swords and sorcery adventure? Or the start of a lifetime of enslavement at the hands of space goblins? I don't know! Nobody does. That's why you gotta come to the plains and find out! Wipe the cheese dust off your disc- Disgusting fingers! Get out of your gamer chair and come! come where? To the plains! You want excitement? We got it! You want romance? We got it! You want combat? We'll see what we can do! But one thing's for sure, you gotta come! 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 Call now! I mean, I guess I could- Come! Thought it was over. Planescape Torment is an isometric avant-garde multiverse CRPG and journal updater. It was developed by Black Isle Studios and published by Interplay Entertainment for PC in 1999, and in the years following it has since found its way to PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and mobile devices if that's how you choose to live your life. Planescape. Torment's setting existed as a Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting created by Zeb Cook, a world he sought to create based on the vagueness of the outer planes of Dungeons and Dragons, the mishmash of religious and mythological odds and ends that lampshade the game's alignment system. Tired of, as he put it, big muscled swordsmen rescuing princesses and clearing out dungeons, he found the idea of making these cosmic planes that supposedly no one would have any reason in their right mind to visit explorable and thus creating a hub in which all the worlds of D&D would be linked to be an inventive new direction, taking all these elements that are illogically crammed together and have it make sense that they are. In an era when the CRPG had found a sort of comfortable rhythm, a string of games, Torment included, would emit a discordant shriek that would disrupt and shake up the format pulling attention away from whichever ultimate game you had installed, saying, that ain't nothing, you little nerd, you little shithead. It was real confrontational. I know I was scared. At every step, Torment would attempt to subvert the expectation of the average CRPG enjoyer, turn the established tropes on their head right from the opening cutscene, one which depicts the player character's death, though not as an end state. Death would instead be used to advance the plot. Torment would also leap over the expected paperwork of RPGs. You wouldn't preemptively draft out the particulars of your character's stats, class, alignment, and personality type. You'd just begin as a blank state that doesn't even know who he is and piece it together through experience and the company you keep around you. Well met, Traveler. Uh, I'm jumping backwards in time from the future here. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to preemptively say I'm sorry. I fucked up. Uh, a future where I realized that I use the term CRPG a lot, and I don't know how commonly that term is still used. Some games continue to tag themselves as CRPG despite not fitting my definition of one. As I knew it, it was a term used to describe a game that either began as a tabletop RPG and has now been rendered in computer game format, or a game that invents its own variation of this type of rule set. A D&D like, a GURPS like, something like Fallout's special system, which behaves similar to a tabletop game despite not beginning as one. Not too deep within me, I'm sure that really the only requirement for me to describe something as a CRPG is that it be isometric and that at some point I have to fight big, big rats. Never commit to anything. 
Be changeable. Keep moving. This is how you survive. In 1996, Black Isle was gearing up to start several projects using the world of Planescape, ready to wring this IP of all its worth. At first, Interplay had Black Isle's attention split on other projects and eventually the planned Rise of Planescape was hastily forgotten, joining the Dark Universe in whatever plane of abandoned dreams I imagine they dwell in. The first of these was to be a proper CRPG titled simply Planescape. This project, led by Zeb Cook himself, was to be the sort of flagship Planescape game. Planescape's answer to Baldur's Gate, much like what Baldur's Gate was to Baldur's Gate, on account of its name being just Planescape. So it was like the Baldur's Gate of Planescape. Planescape, the computer game, if you will. You gotta keep up, I'm a good words... Holder? The second project was led by another person who worked on the tabletop setting, Colin McComb, which would have amounted to a PlayStation game set in Planescape but inspired by the gameplay of From Software's Kingsfield series, where you'd play as a Harmonium Guard, a lawful good faction that is confronted with a conspiracy involving the Blood War an eternal conflict between law and chaos that simmers beneath most Planescape narratives. Six months of work went into plotting out and creating a design document for this game, but at some point, word came down from Interplay Management that the idea of three Planescape games in production was redundant. To remedy this, the PlayStation game was cancelled, Colin McComb, Zeb Cook, and Zeb's work on the main Planescape game were transferred over to another project led by Chris Avalon and utilizing by Bioware's Infinity Engine, then called Planescape Last Rites. To further spit on the grave of McComb's work, everything made for the PS1 Planescape game, plus a shitload of money, was funneled into development for a game called Stonekeep 2, a sequel to 1995's Stonekeep. And I gotta say, I think they made the right call, because Stonekeep 2, after five years in development, turned out to be one of the best, most groundbreaking RPGs ever made in the universe where it wasn't cancelled. Behind the scenes, in 1997, Black Isle produced a 47-page design document, a vision statement for Planescape Last Rites, to pitch to Interplay. What's still impressive reading this now is just how clear this vision was. Just about everything in it, save for some plot details, came to be, more or less, as laid out here. And it is interesting to see some of the game design philosophies devised from the beginning. The dev team was told things like, if you've seen it done before, do it better than you've ever seen or don't do it. Reiterating that Planescape isn't high fantasy, it's avant-garde fantasy, so no object or location within it should be easily recognizable as a real-life thing. If there's a Little Caesars on the corner, it's built into the desiccated ribcage of a dead interdimensional lizard, and a hot and ready is magically compressed into a single shimmering bite-sized cube. Hey, but you know what? I bet it's still only five dollars. Some things you just don't change no matter how artsy farts your game is. I'll tell you what, man, I'll tell you what. Anywho. An odd side effect of reading this is getting a glimpse at how a game as complex and cerebral as this needed to be distilled and summarized into corporate man-child speak as to be better understood by the gamer council. Amongst its fuck and shit laden nerd bait it promises, tons of total babes. This game will have lots of babes that make the player go wow. There will be fiendish babes, human babes, angelic babes, Asian babes, which are their own category, and even undead babes. These babes will be present without nippleage and will all regrettably behave within the TSR code of ethics. I actually had to look up this code of ethics because I had never heard of it before, as it's a part of the creation of materials and not really something you'd observe at home. As you may know, back in the 1980s, TSR, D&D's original publisher, was the cause of a moral panic from right-wing Christian groups like Bad or Bothered about Dungeons and Dragons for promoting Satanism, sexual deviancy, and basement dwelling via role-playing games. It is important to remember that the source of all magic is the life force of the user. This is the teaching of the occult. This is exactly what we were introduced into in Star Wars and E.T. This was in some part due to some murders, suicides, and murder-suicides of young people, where I'm assuming distraught parents, eager for an explanation, blamed a funny make em up game to explain their grief. Battles, maiming, killing... Hey, it's all imagination. Is it? Yeah.
Also to blame was some artwork included in early editions of the player's handbook that got them so horny it was infuriating. In response to this, TSR wrote up a list of things that could not be included in any D&D branded material, whether it be novels, campaign handbooks, what have you, and unsurprisingly the guidelines are very strict and sound as though they were hastily scribbled at gunpoint, made up of most things you'd immediately think to put in your D&D campaign, like profanity, promoting distrust in law enforcement, depicting religious figures as villains, glamorizing crime, excessive gore, and most intriguingly, sexual abnormalities. By the time Planescape was announced, the rights to D&D had been handed over to Wizards of the Coast, so maybe they softened some of these, because there are certainly a few of those things in there. Torment's dev team, or Last Rites, set out to immediately break one of these guidelines. Number one across two different iterations of this code is that good must, no matter what, triumph over evil in the end. And those who stoop to evil will be rightly punished for it. Moral flexibility was important to their vision. Finding the idea of the morally correct answer being the only correct answer simply boring. And on the creation of the game storyline, inspiration was drawn from other RPGs like Shadowrun and video game RPGs like Final Fantasy VII. Despite boasting a script of 800,000 words, there was still a good deal of content that had to be cut in order to meet Interplay's deadline. Something which seemed to have left a chip on on the shoulder of producer Guido Henkel, uh, along with the fact that his name isn't as synonymous with Planescape as others like Chris Avalon. To be fair though, Avalon's name is now associated with a lot of things. By complete happenstance, thanks to a scheduling conflict, Henkel wound up leaving a very important mark on this game however, as it is his corpse-like and erroneously blue face emblazoned on the game's very recognizable cover art. It's iconic and recognizable not only because of his face, but for the insane decision to make this the cover of the game. A cover that shouts, I don't care if you play me or not. I see you eyeballing Boulder's Gate instead. Buy that. You think I give a shit? Left yourself exposed, idiot. On release, the game was met with substantial acclaim, vacuuming awards up like an Eldritch Kirby, and being placed on a number of lists of not only best RPGs, but best. PC Gamer would write, when it comes right down to it, this game is a masterpiece of role-playing. The dialogue is some of the most well-written of any RPG, the environments are varied and downright enthralling, the spell effects are mind-blowing, and the story contains some of the most inventive, unique characters players will ever have in a party. Though certainly enough time has passed that a new generation of gamers have picked up the game and had their own idiotic opinion on it, or some have walked back their once glowing review, it's hard to find many mainstream critics reviews of the era that express anything critical beyond a mild indifference. Eurogamer went, I guess, as close to the throat as you could by saying, it's far from perfect, and the casual way it treats death was something of a turnoff for me, but it's still about as good as they come. If nothing else, it should keep you busy until Baldur's Gate 2 is released. Oh, look at me. I like elves and goblins. That's me. I genuinely do. I don't know why I'm doing this voice. Praise aside, like most good games, Planescape Torment was ultimately a commercial failure. One of many side effects of the gamer curse. You just can't get them to play good games. Though over the next few years, after word of mouth spread, this niche within a niche within a niche of a game eventually made profit. This is the part where I feel like I should say, and Planescape Torment went on to inspire a bunch of copycat games and its legacy left ripples resounding throughout all of gaming, its influence seeping noticeably into many other enjoyable games. But I don't think that would entirely be appropriate to say, as very few games have really attempted as arduous and risky a task as Torment did, skillfully introducing and having fun with a bizarre and novel fantasy setting, breaking the comfortable conventions of the RPG, and including a phone book's worth of text in it, and having that remain consistently interesting enough to carry you throughout hours of reading. I mean gameplay. Not to say there were no games that stepped up to attempt just that, certainly Disco Elysium and Torment's spiritual successor, but not many more. Over the years, Torment would be re-released a handful of times, most substantially for its enhanced edition from Beamdog in 2017, which is the version featured in this video, which adds a number of improvements, accessibility options, and restores some incomplete content. I think if I were revising this game, I would have amended the glaring 
recurring typo concerning the brothel for slating intellectual lusts, which should have been sating or slaking. But you don't want to give me any power like that. You grant me that one thing, pretty soon just fire everywhere. Burning. Death. Devastation. Darkness. Though it refrains from indulging in that too much, making this version more of a preservational effort than an attempt to make it better. Maybe hot take, but I like when older games are preserved, kept up to date and easily available, unless it's a Nintendo game. Too long have I known them simply as free games. I'll take a moment to introduce Planescape as a location, and honestly, another one of the characters in this story, <laughs> to borrow the parlance of someone who did not accept video games as an artistic medium. What the Planescape setting sought to do was sort of make explorable all of the campaign settings devised by TSR. I'm going to assume excluding, like, licensed properties turned modules, but every setting put within a shared multiverse where each world is its own universe or plane on a spinning ring in the cosmos called the Great Wheel. Many of these worlds were, until Planescape, merely suggested or used to wave away some aspect of character creation. But now all these places would be real locations a level 1 elf rogue could visit, each with its own rules. Torment is set in the Outlands, a neutral plane at the center of the Great Wheel, composed of a giant, seemingly infinite spire, at the top of which floats a city where most of your time will be spent. The name of this city is Sigil, kind of like you're saying Siegel really fast. A name that I instinctively read as Sigil, but it is in fact Sigil. Zeb Cook decided on this pronunciation as a result of his own mispronunciation of Sigil, which he just doubled down on. Like most fantasy jargon in an RPG, if the players know what you're talking about, there's no use being pedantic about how it's said, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. All this to say, I'm going to turn Zeb's logic right back on him and refer to it as Sigil. And if you've got a problem with that, go ahead and, and roll a d12 to see how successfully you go fuck yourself. This is a floating city on top of a spire on the inner ring of a landmass shaped like a torus, where there is no sky, only a light that sometimes goes on and off so you know when to close up your potion shop or whatever. The other thing about Sigil is that it is also known as the City of Doors. This is because it acts as an ever-shifting and morphing hub world in between the planes, full of countless portals to other planes, not organized and labeled in a facility, mind you, just all over the place, hidden from view, each requiring their own key. Almost none of which are just a regular key, but some kind of offering, a phrase, a gesture, a thought, could be anything. There are some that people know about, and many more that they don't, leading to many people just winding up in Sigil by accident. They were off adventuring in Greyhawk when they stopped at the entrance to a cave and then remembered what their aunt's apple pie tasted like, or they fell into a well while screaming their biggest regret and that launched them over to Sigil, with no idea of how to return. Because of this, Sigil is a melting pot of every kind of person, demon, deity, or robot from all the planes. It's like the cantina in Star Wars, but as a whole city and has yet to be milked of anything initially interesting about it. Sigil is overseen by a being named the Lady of Pain, a powerful entity that maintains balance in the city using rather strict methods. Nobody's actually really seen her or communicated with her, and anything anybody knows is relayed by a race of speechless creatures called Dabis, her servants that float around fixing or breaking things to suit the Lady's desires. They communicate using floating symbols that materialize over their heads. If someone were to threaten the balance of Sigil, the Lady of Pain would have them killed, or worse, mazed, meaning they are banished to wander a maze of her own design for all eternity. Despite being clearly omnipotent and all-powerful, she refuses to be worshipped as a god. If you even try to pray to her, she'll maze you. If you try to mock her, she'll maze you. If you attack her, goons, maze. Kill too many people, maze. Try to worship the previous guy in charge, maybe you might be a guy that got maze. You gotta work to not end up in that maze. And yeah, I'm sure that's bad. Like, there's gotta be something about being mazed that is objectively unpleasant. But it's hard for me to 
not see it as just free housing. If this already sounds like a lot to retain, it's a good thing we're given control of a character as clueless as you. Our protagonist is a nameless human man, covered in scars and tattoos to the point of appearing like a corpse. He wakes up on a slab in a mortuary within Sigil, with no memory of how he came to be there. For much of the game, he is referred to as the Nameless One, but you have several opportunities to just lie and say your name is Adam. We also meet the first of several traveling companions we can collect along the way, Mort, a floating talking skull that helps guide the Nameless One around and provides some insight to the culture and goings on in Sigil. I was going to correct myself, but it is the correct thing. <laughs> I guess it's harder to commit to that bit than I thought. This is ideally what he does. A lot of the time, he just kind of hides ulterior motives and uh, tries to fuck zombies. Ooh, I want to be buried with her. Your coffin or mine? Mort lets the Nameless One know that he has a full paragraph of instructions tattooed on his back that tell him to find his journal and a man named Farid. What they lean into pretty immediately and is hard to ignore is the unique vocabulary found in Sigil that you'll start to pick up on. Mort immediately hits you left and right with several slang terms, some of which have a basis in existing dialects, but others are a bit more creative. Hey, Chief, you okay? You playing corpse or you putting the blinds on the dusties? <laughs> I thought you were a debtor for sure. Things like saying chant in place of rumor or news, as in what's the chant, what's new? You'll come across many characters that refer to you as a cutter, which you could think of as a replacement for boss or chief. It's like a respectful but casual term that implies you're a resourceful and cool guy. There's a ton more that you can learn just by context, but if you want to be sure, there is usually a dialogue option that's like, wait, you just said bar me, what does that mean? There's a very specific limit to my memory. I know like like how to eat. I know how to dress myself in bones. I know how to raise the dead, but I can't remember any of these funny make em up words. In keeping with the rest of Torment, it would be diminishing to say this building is just a mortuary. It's the mortuary, home to a faction of Sigil named the Dustmen. One of 15 factions, groups of differently flavored weirdos that have banded together behind some spiritual interpretation of the world they're all stuck in. This is something that was included in the tabletop game mostly as a response to the popularity of Vampire the Masquerade and its clans. Everybody's doing clans now, so we gotta have them too, because the very idea of this wasn't complex enough. So Sigil has these factions, which you can join to gain a variety of benefits and resources, though that is limited to only a few in this video game version. The Dustmen are a universally disliked group of black-pilled monks that believe life in Sigil is a shadow, not true life, and ultimately the best thing for all of us would be to just die. Where we would achieve what they call true death. Things like love, passion, hobbies, a Funko Pop collection, these are all worldly anchors keeping us stuck in a half-life without peace. They run this massive mortuary where they pay a few coins to anyone that hauls in a body. Some in Sigil have found loopholes to make good money doing that. Dead bodies are catalogued, embalmed, stored, or cremated, and aside from meditating on how rad it would be to die, that's pretty much all they do. This is a pretty ironic group for the Nameless One to wake up to as he soon learns that this isn't the first time he's been wheeled into the mortuary in a pile of corpses. Far from it. In fact, the scribe tasked with notating all the dead brought in is frankly sick of seeing you slink out of here, and especially of seeing others die because of the Nameless One's influence. He's not the only one to refer to your condition as a curse and a blessing. It appears he simply cannot die, preventing him from achieving the Dustman's ultimate goal. Well, more accurately, he is immortal, so he can die, but it never seems to take. For whatever reason, upon waking up this time, your memories have all but completely vanished. But some of these memories will come trickling back, hinting that this is likely not the first hard reset the Nameless One has endured, meaning for who knows how long he's lived numerous varied lives all over the plains. You'll come across many characters that have had vastly different interactions or even relationships with some incarnation of him. The scribe mentions a woman that died following him that is now memorialized here. While he and Mort are trying to make their way out of the mortuary, the Nameless One finds this memorial and is visited by the ghost of a woman named D. 
Dianara. He enters some kind of fugue state where only he can converse with her and she is struck with a range of strong emotions upon seeing our hero. She's angry, bitter, sad, but clearly still deeply in love with him. Whatever he did pre-memory wipe must have really hurt and ultimately killed her. And despite this, she still helps you regain some of your memories, very importantly, the memory about how to raise the dead. Should you wish for it, she can also provide a cryptic glimpse into the future, where apparently the Nameless One will be confronted by a fortress made of regret and be forced to make a sacrifice that will end his immortality. One of the wildest things about Torment is how many variables exist within it. Even in the first area you wake up in, which does act a bit like a tutorial area, there are a number of ways you can make your way through it, secrets to find, or even just inconsequential world building. Things that change based on your skills or your temperament. Also, because I'm a complete asshole, during the first playthrough for this video, I had foolishly tried to attack the Dustmen, which triggered an alarm that made all of them hostile to me, so I had to kill several of them. And also, because I was just in a hurry to get the fuck out, I didn't talk to Dianara and played the whole game to the end without the ability to revive my followers. Hmm, wonder what this is. Well, guess who was nothing? And this is a good thing though, you can rest assured that your own idiocy that may have kept you from unlocking a basic function of the game did not prevent me from having a complete and fulfilling gaming experience. Also, it's surprisingly forgiving about severing threads of prophecy, because in my rush to the front door, I killed a dude named Soigo, who is sort of significant in a later quest, but you meet him later as if nothing happened, and you can ask him, didn't I kill you? And he's just like, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, Sigil's weird like that. <laughs> you got that right, <laughs> brother. In subsequent playthroughs, there were countless ways I could differ from the path taken before, and things I didn't even notice the first time. Whether you get DNR's help or enlist the aid of a zombie spy, the Nameless One and Mort make it outside to the streets of Sigil. And upon leaving, we are shown a bunch of shadowy creatures looming over the slab where you rose from the dead. Almost as if they were expecting you to be there, but just missed you. Looking for Ferret is the main objective, but of course there are several things you can get mixed up in. Some amount to fetch quests, others to substantial side content leading to interesting items or experience, but the most impressive thing for me is that no matter how significant, they are most of the time written with as much detail and consideration as the main storyline. There's a quest that's quite literally a lady at a cafe wants you to go tell her friend to meet her at that cafe. And I didn't really think about the simplicity of it because it also worked in a fascinating bit of world building where they both turn out to be ASMR from the Forgotten Realms and can communicate by sort of manipulating reality with their thoughts and feelings. Depending on how much you pry, you can even learn that one of them intimately knew one of your previous incarnations and killed another in self-defense, or rather affected his mind such that he did it himself. But I use this example just to instill that even when the task is sort of mundane or contrived, it's not a squandered opportunity. It is almost always used to do something other than tick a box in your journal and toss some experience. Your way. There's always some kind of narrative reward that could be genuinely insightful concerning the mystery of the Nameless One, or just some surreal, darkly comedic scenario that only the planes could produce. A rich socialite that wants to pay you to allow her to kill you just to know what it feels like. A man that summons a zombie to tolerate his overly talkative friend in his stead, but it still has enough cognitive function to beg you to put it out of its misery. A woman that's been hopelessly wandering from portal to portal trying to find her way home and somehow wound up with sentient teeth. There's several of these little stories packed into every area. In between doing main quest stuff, you'll be bouncing back and forth between a number of locations in Sigil and crossing paths with many different factions and groups that produce their own amusing quests and interactions. Like the Sensates, members of the Society of Sensation, a bunch of live-for-today types that believe you can only really be a part of the multiverse if you live to experience every bit of it. They do this mostly by collecting and touching things called sensory stones, objects with recorded experiences in them that temporarily immerse you in the thoughts and emotional state of another. It's kind of like VR, you know, a pointless luxury that just makes you sick. Haha, <laughs> get wrecked VR owners! 
Uh, by the way, how is Half-Life Alex? I can't afford it, but it looks cool. They are also associated with a building called the Brothel for Slating Intellectual Lusts, where aspiring sensates are paid to spend time intellectually stimulating patrons through debate, storytelling, or games. This place is run by a reformed succubus, a Tanari, named Fall from Grace, that could be one of your allies, should you wish it. Pretty early on, you start collecting followers, which is an important piece of the game. Aside from helping you in combat, you can converse with them, or hear them chime in during conversations, and all of them have really well-defined personalities. If you give them the time, you really grow to enjoy their company, and if you don't like one, you can always just abandon them at the mall. Uh, yeah, Valor, could you just hang out here? I'll be right back. Yeah, I'm just gonna stop by Anchor Blue and buy a plastic shirt. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh fuck. Get the fuck out of here, man. Within the first quest or so, you'll likely pick up Dakon, a Githzeri warrior, coming from the plain of Limbo, a place where only those who know themselves achieve flesh. He wields a Karak blade, one that only followers of Xerthamon are worthy enough to handle, that changes shape with his thoughts, like a mood ring that also cuts people in half. It might be a little jarring how he winds up joining you, like you just bump into him at a bar, and as though he's been through this whole rigmarole too many times, he's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're looking for an extra sword, right? All right, let's just get this over with so I can get back to drinking whatever fantasy beverage they serve here. Ink squeezed from a space octopus or Pepsi Blue. <laughs> That's the second one of those in a row. I guess I'm just, I guess I'm just really feeling 2002 right now. But in my defense, it was the mix. The damn thing's cursed. Which there is a reason for, but that is discussed later down the line. The other early follower that you're likely to keep around is Anna of the Shadows, or just Anna, a tiefling rogue with a rat's tail and an easily irritated attitude, ready and willing to dispense some kind of insult or threat of bodily harm, that grudgingly joins your party to accomplish a job, but winds up sticking around, because though she'd never admit it in a million years, she kinda likes the Nameless One, and wants him to find the answers he's after. Through much wandering around and question asking, we eventually hone in on this ferret guy. Turns out, he's the leader of a group of collectors, those working the Cash for Corpses racket, turning in anything dead to the dustman for a few coins. They dislike him on account of the sheer volume of bodies he regularly dumps at their doorstep, making it plainly obvious that he's got some kind of secret corpse honey hole that rival groups of collectors want access to. I kind of like Ferret as a character, he's like a bad guy doing his best to atone, trying to do good with the only skill set he knows evil. From the first exchange, you get the impression that he's just a liar down to his core. Even though Farad greets you like an old friend, when he notices the Nameless One doesn't remember him, he immediately capitalizes on that. Do I know you? I mean, yeah. Wait, no. Okay, yes. No. Hmm, perhaps I might be able to scrounge up some information on you if you help me out with something. As Farad begins to describe the trifle trinket he needs help collecting, they do this thing that I love about Torment's writing, where they interject the thought process of the protagonist and what he seems to find significant about someone's words or actions. It doesn't even have to be particularly helpful, it's just really interesting how it hints at events down the line, or implies that there's something important happening here whether you really know it or not. The Nameless One fixates on the description of the object Farad wants in return for answers, a bronze sphere. He's heard this same speech before because he remembers saying it at some point over the decades he's lived multiple divergent lives, but not the context in which he did. He can even finish describing it before Farad can, which throws him off guard. I think it's really fun how many people in Sigil- S Sigil- fuck, FUCK IT! It's Sigil now! I'm saying it right now! How many people sort of know who you are? Quick to point out that, well, you don't quite act like that guy, or you look like you've gained a few more scars, have different dummies lined up behind you. Because of this, some remember a thing you told them, a deal you made, or just some kind of instruction if you ever came knocking again. And often people will just inadvertently point you in the right direction for the main quest, remembering some tidbit of where you were going. Some of them respond kind of awkwardly, feeling it strange that you don't remember meeting, so they're clearly withholding things like, is this a bit? Are we doing a bit where we don't remember each other? Not that I would know, because we've never met. Unless this is not a bit, in which case, we didn't not not. <laughs>
The Bronze Sphere is somewhere in the network of catacombs and tunnels beneath Sigil, which happens to be the secret to Farad's success as a collector. He's been grifting the Dustmen by digging up long dead corpses and reselling them back. This is hinted at in some documents you can find in the mortuary. Dustmen kept receiving corpses that had already been properly prepared for burial, and they couldn't figure out why. I'd imagine the frequent appearance of one corpse getting up and wandering around asking what literally anything in the world was and why any anything was anything, probably roused some suspicion as well. Why am I blue on the box art? I don't know, buddy, because making games is complicated, and sometimes you end up as a blue man. I think this is as good a place as any to break for spoilers. This is a game that plays like a heavy tome, a compendium of stories replete with histories and bestiaries, where even an inconsequential item, a ring you found in a puddle of piss in a back alley, is accompanied by a retelling of its lifespan and properties over the course of several paragraphs. Anything I've said is barely scratching the surface, but if none of that has intrigued you in the slightest, this might not be your kind of game. Torment kind of lives or dies by how interested in it you are. Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. It's a it's a 20 year old game. If you, if you haven't played it yet, probably never will. That's fine. Good. Don't play it. Is it working? Do you feel like you want to play it? Please come. Starting this week, all travel to the Outer Plains is half, half off. off. That's right. Are you struggling to keep the lights on? Your landlord regrettably still alive? Escape, Escape to the, the Plains. 50% off. Not including the fees we need to cover the cost of summoning the portal. I can't believe we're offering this. I went up to management and said, are, are you serious? serious? We're practically giving away this life-changing opportunity for, for half, half the, the price. price. He looks me dead in the eyes and said, just read the f***ing script. There's a whole room full of dum-dums willing to do it if you can't. And I said, hang on, Bill, I really need this. I burned the bridge at my last job when I got hired here. I pissed in the fryer. They'll arrest me if I step foot in there. And he said, and No, you can't do this. I have rights. Call now. You know, I don't think I'm quite convinced yet. Also upset, I'd imagine, about Farad's scheme of selling the already buried dead is the Dead Nation. Deep in the catacombs under Sigil is a society of reanimated dead, ruled by an entity called the Silent King. While searching for the Bronze Sphere, you are forced to enter their territory, and thus agree to enslavement there forever. Unable to talk to the Silent King directly, you ask through his intermediary for some kind of trade. This is easier if you help a dead woman remember her name, which due to the deteriorating state of her mind and body had been lost to her. In return for assisting her, she teaches you stories bones tell, the ability to speak the language of the dead, which disappointingly is not a series of death metal growls and guttural moans, but more of a telepathic understanding. You sort of interface with what is left of their spirit. This opens up a number of opportunities and different dialogue options throughout the rest of the game as well. The main thing to be done here is assisting the dead nation with their rad problem, both literal and figurative, and then like both at the same time. There are actual rats in the form of cranium rats that gain a hive mind intelligence as they gain numbers. Those need to be killed as they feed off the zombies. They also have a spy in their midst, but that spy is also a were rat working for the other rats. I'd prefer to not kill rats or rat folk, or rats and X people, but also I, I'm usually just pleased by seeing rat representation in gaming. I think that is ultimately the most important takeaway. <laughs> Satisfying the Silent King allows you to leave and continue looking for the sphere, which is sort of unceremoniously laying with the belongings of a dead adventurer, but on the precipice of some kind of trap-laden puzzle room that one of your previous incarnations left for you. Inside, you find various carvings documenting the thoughts of what may be several different versions of yourself. They hopelessly ponder what your immortality means. Is it a punishment? Is there a divine reason? And how do you end it? They also cover the morality of it all. If a different version of me committed some kind of terrible crime, while another led an altruistic life aligned with good, will I be judged? as one instead of many. Some are more paranoid and vengeful, blaming this condition on the Nameless One's first killer, one that may still be hunting him and aware of his ability to cheat death. This persona is likely why, out of all the pertinent clues that could have been tattooed on your back, your name wasn't among them. A past self insists on the importance of remaining nameless. Names are only the means by which you can be tracked across the plains. 
Why put your clues on your back, though, where you need it to be read to you by someone else? Uh, yeah, let's see. Don't forget your journal, look for Farid, and I'm a stupid moron with an ugly face and a big butt, and my butt smells, and I like to kiss my own butt. Huh, weird. When Farad gets his sphere, he reveals that many years ago, a very different nameless one approached him to cut a deal, where, if any of his collectors found his corpse, they would prevent the dustmen from cremating it. He doesn't know the location of your journal, but suggests you ask the one who found your body last, his adopted daughter, Anna. He instructs her to show you where you were found a place he calls the Haunted Alley, and maybe pick up on the trail of your lost belongings. The path to this alley is through a gang hideout, magically concealed with a painted on door. As you make your way through it, we see that Ferret is attacked by the shadow creatures from earlier, once again just missing you. Arriving at a place actually called the Alley of Lingering Sighs, Anna leads you to the very spot where she initially mistook the nameless one for a corpse where a face made of stone appears from a nearby wall. It speaks to them, recalling that it saw you die here. Suddenly, the Nameless One unlocks a memory of being surrounded by the shadows, and they tear him apart. Anna then finds him already somewhat intact. It becomes apparent that this voice is not just a face in a wall in an alley, it is the alley. For whatever reason, this alley and every ruined building and path within it is a single, living being that wishes to divide, to spread itself further. This would open up new areas of sigil that have been cut off. The only thing preventing it is the Dabis, the Lady of Pain's drones. They mindlessly busy themselves with fixing parts of the alley, which halts it from essentially birthing new bits of alley. So in order to help out the alley, you gotta help it get rid of the dabis in the area and essentially undo all the repairs. I remember this plot point being where things sort of solidified for me. I found myself grinning at how delightfully bizarre this detail was. This ultimately unimportant little aside that is in its own way a whole game's worth of an idea all on its own. There's a lot of things in games that can elicit joy within me. A well-written character with an emotional core, a grid inventory, a lead pipe as a weapon. And one kind of joy that so rarely gets appeased is just appreciating a really creative idea. This is a big ideas game, it's overflowing with them. Are all of them amazing? Yes! Is that an exaggeration? Yes. Am I lying? Yes. Am I a liar? Yes. <laughs> Even though there is technically a lawful and chaotic solution to this, the outcome is equally fucked up. You get a better sense of it if you have the ability to talk to the dead, but you essentially just have to box it in like a Sims character, where it circles a room with no exit, desperately hammering away to no avail until it withers and dies. And then the Grim Reaper rides in on a skateboard and poofs him into a tombstone. I don't know, I've never played The Sims. The alley begins to change shape, and the gang heads through to the next area. Right at the gate, they are distracted while two were-rats kidnap Mort. So you start doing what the Nameless One does best. Best, asking questions. Much like the last stretch of Sigil, there are plenty of activities to get mixed up in if you don't want to sprint to the conclusion. You could help a Harmonium Guard find love, help cure a man who's been cursed to piss and shit himself for all eternity, or ping pong back and forth between the Sensates at the brothel, addressing a web of little fetch quests, some of which are actually quite involved. Apparently, there's a local guy named Lothar, Master of the Bones, which sounds like as good a place as any to start looking. Lothar turns out to be a powerful wizard with an impressive collection of skulls, and he refuses to let go of Mort unless you find a more interesting skull to replace him with. There are actually seven instances where you can collect a suitably interesting skull. I wound up giving him the head of the were-rat spy from the Dead Nations. Pleased with the replacement, he is willing to entertain some questions. The Nameless One learns that the reason he is immortal is that his mortality has been magically stripped from him by someone named Ravel Puzzlewell, a night hag. A woman Lothar claims was so evil that the Lady of Pain had her mazed. She now dwells in a pocket dimension out of reach unless you know the portal and key. I really appreciate the lead up to Ravel because 
Look, you talk to a lot of people in this game. That's kind of the main thing you do in it. And everyone has something to say about Ravel. And they'll usually add an interesting tidbit about her history, or they'll simply be too afraid to discuss her. Though she may be rotting in an extra-dimensional prison, she's left her mark on Sigil, as one of few brazen enough to earn the contempt of the Lady of Pain. And it makes the confrontation with her, and the realization of what kind of person she really is, very impactful. They essentially sell her as a Disney movie villain, but the truth is actually really well presented. The woman who runs Sigil's art gallery expands that she's from an order of evil hags, from the plain of Hades and had come to Sigil as a result of her obsession with puzzles. The one that plagued her the most being Torment's sort of recurring motif question. What can change the nature of a man? Though you don't need to commit to any of the factions for life, joining them can reveal a lot of interesting information and unlock new memories. Along with the Dustmen, you got the Godsmen, or Believers of the Source, a faction that kinda reads the closest to Christianity. They believe there is a purpose to the multiverse, it isn't as random and uncaring as you'd think. Also, when you die, depending on the life you've lived, you'll either ascend to some kind of celestial divinity, or be reincarnated as a lower being. Mobile gamers, perhaps. The Revolutionary League is a group of anarchists that wish to see all the other factions dismantled, believing one should seek the truth of the multiverse and decide for themselves what it all means. The Chaosetics, or Chaos Men, are a group of barking, raffle to random weirdos that embrace their chaotic alignment and believe there is no order in the universe. Only randomness holds up Spork. Joining these guys requires you to go complete Joker mode, but it does result in some amusing exchanges. You get some XP for joining them, and if you simply ask to join again, whereupon the recruiter replies, you're already a member, you get another hit of XP if you respond with, exactly. One of the most significant memories is unlocked when you gain access to the Society of Sensations private sensorium. Joining them grants you the ability to use sensory stones to experience the sensations of those who recorded memories and experiences on them. One of these stones happens to have been recorded by the ghost we met in the mortuary Dianara. There are a lot of revelations in this game that you can learn about in different ways. Like if you don't touch her sensory stone and experience this, the information within will be relayed to you eventually in some way. But this particular moment did stay with me long after the first playthrough, thanks to the quality of writing and my ability to be emotionally affected by almost anything. Set here as a monument to the feeling of longing. This experience recounts, through Dianera's eyes, a moment in which the Nameless One has returned from some journey and asks her for help. But it's written in such a way that our Nameless One is forced to experience both ends of this brutal conversation. Being placed in the body and thoughts of Dianara, this woman that loves him endlessly, would literally and probably did die for him, and yet also regaining the hazy memory of this other him, a nameless one he knows to be a heartless monster that is manipulating her. Because he at one point was that person. Knowing both sides, he knows that he's essentially watching this woman sign her death warrant by trusting him with her life. This extreme clashing of emotions winds up being too much for him, and he screams with bloody tears shooting out of his eyes when he comes back to reality, something only Fall From Grace seemed to give a shit about in this public setting. I guess if this is the kind of thing people regularly get off on, then they'd probably just side-eye you mid-conversation like, I don't have what he's having. <laughs> Pain. Misery. I think the added weight of unlocking the memory of this event and at the same time reliving it created a sort of gazing into a mirror within a mirror effect. A being John Malkovich nightmare where he was the abused and the abuser. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Updated my journal! One of the other stones, surprisingly, seems to put you in contact with Ravel for a brief period. Though these are meant to be a record, you seem to be able to exchange words through some bit of trickery she must have devised. She urges him to find her, giving some cryptic hints and referring to him as her precious man. Amidst the asking of numerous questions, we learn that the key to Ravel's maze lies in the blood of her daughter, a sensate student at the brothel that simply refuses to acknowledge her relation to a notorious monster. Inside Ravel's maze, you finally meet the legend, the myth, the tiny plump bean, 
that is Ravel Puzzlewell. A not too threatening, classic Halloween witch, one you'd no doubt see riding a broom with a black cat in tow, or waving their hands over a bubbling cauldron exclaiming, Ee hee hee, I'm a little witch! She at first seems pleased to see you, but upon inspecting the damage done to your body laments that the nameless one is no longer the one she knew. I guess there are a couple moments that the game's title could come from, but I'd wager a lot of it is this scene, when she equates the misery that the various versions of the Nameless One have caused and endured as endless torment, attracting others in torment to follow him into oblivion. The next bit is important, especially if you've kept up correspondence with your followers. You can talk at length with each of your followers, learning about their history, their motivations, or their opinions of the other followers. Pretty much all of them have these sort of dead ends you hit though. Things they don't want to discuss no matter how much you pry. It's here that Ravel sort of calls out each of them one by one, and hints at the torment that attracted them to the Nameless One, like he's some kind of anguish magnet. All of these can be dug out of them now through your conversations. What's immediately clear in Ravel's rambling is that despite looking like an unlovable cartoon hag, she clearly held a deep fondness for the original Nameless One. She still refers to him as beautiful, her precious man and her pretty thing, and recounting the moment he lost his mortality and thus she lost the person she cared about does seem rather difficult for her. She can't recall why the original wanted immortality other than he desperately sought to prolong his life. But she knows that she certainly regrets giving it to him. I'd imagine her affection for him was so strong, she didn't really care why he wanted it, she just wanted to appease him. Even though the Nameless One can shake off death innumerable times, there is a hidden cost. With every death, he steals the life of another to continue. The shadows that pursue him are the result of this, vengeful shades of stolen life that exist only to destroy their creator. After she had performed the ritual to remove his mortality, she killed him to test if it had worked, only to realize that with his mortality left his memories, leaving only a shell of the one she loved. A truth Anna is able to read from her words. Ravel is unable to undo the ritual, return the Nameless One's mortality to his shell, but she suggests consulting a Deva, an angel in the classic sense, a guy with wings that once dwelled in the seven heavens, but is now stuck down here in the astral sticks. For me, this whole sequence is probably the game's peak, so part of me wishes it took more time to get here. I mean, really, there is so much you can actually do before this point that saying that is a little absurd. I feel like you could actually do maybe 80% of the game's content if you really took the time to chat up everyone in Sigil. But there is something so final and satisfying about the confrontation with Ravel. It feels like the culmination of so much, and yet really, you're just given another name to wander the plains asking around for. And while I like everything that comes after this point, it does begin to feel like a different experience altogether. It feels faster, more linear, and eventually it narrows into a straight road to the finish line. In looking around online, it doesn't seem like anyone has a clear answer on why this is. Could be budget, could be time, could be the manner in which the workload was split between its creators, could be cut content so it would fit on a reasonable number of discs, none of these would surprise me. I've learned to accept that all good games come out of the oven a little lumpy and burnt, like an intellectual, philosophical dino nuggy. Even though she gives you a new lead, when it's time to say goodbye, Ravel becomes enraged and insists that you stay in her maze with her, that it's their home and he will love her as he'd promised to. It's such an interesting subversion that you hear so many horror stories about this mythic monster, but in your final interaction you just kind of pity her. The original Nameless One must have lied and manipulated her in much the same way he did Dianara, had her throw her life away trying to appease him. Even as her words become threats of violence, he's just like, I don't want to do this, there's no need, I'll, I'll just go, hey, maybe I'll come back. But she's just been stewing in this regret and pain for what she did, that all those words carry a venom to them. They fight, and Ravel appears to die. As the gang leaves Ravel's maze, we see that she had only been playing dead, but she's approached by a giant being called the Transcendent One. They speak with some familiarity, and she implies that this incarnation is particularly powerful and is ultimately killed by this Transcendent One. As if this wasn't enough of a bummer, a detail not entirely put under a microscope, but that really affected me, was the fate of Ravel's other fragments. 
other divergent forms of Ravel that led similar but not identical lives in Sigil. One of these being a sweet old mage named Mebeth that can teach you the arts if you like. Who upon realizing that Ravel was killed just kinda accepts that she's gotta go now. Like she just got the letter in the mail and using language not dissimilar to Ravel says there's nothing keeping her here anymore. No! Don't go! Uh, oh. Oh. Bitch out of here quick. Well. Guess I better mosey on out of here. A portal leads the gang to a place in the Outlands named Cursed. This place is interesting because it's what's called a gate town that sits at the border of another plane, in this case a prison plane called Carceri. Every plane in the Great Wheel is influenced by some kind of alignment, burying shades of chaos or law. But the Outlands, specifically Sigil at its center, is true neutral. The places at the edges of the Outlands are not so much, and over time could change alignment, and whole towns could slip into other planes. So if a place like Cursed were to become chaotic enough by, I don't know, cutting all the labels off their mattresses, it could quite literally poof into Carceri, a chaotic evil hell dimension. The Nameless One learns of a deva named Trius that is said to be held prisoner beneath the town, but reaching that requires entering a portal, the key to which is a phrase that nobody knows the full version of. Instead, pieces of it are held by a handful of trusted people, meaning you're gonna have to do tasks for each of them to piece it together. Even if you're trying to be mostly good, all these tasks seem to be a bit chaotic. Especially the one where I let a demon trapped in a pentagram free. That was one that had me like... Hang on. This is usually something too cool to be good, right? And I know this place is teetering on the brink of chaos. Would freeing a big scary demon like... Adversely, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go! Beneath Cursed, the Nameless One finds a burnt and chained up Trius, who is not quite as friendly as one would imagine an angel to be. I'm feeling so gosh dang chaotic right now, dude. Let's just mess stuff up. Let's disrespect our surroundings. Uh oh. You have lost a source of information vital to your quest. Oh shit. Hey, on the bright side, we all leveled up. And we still have each other. Oh, the game's over. I mean, as endings go, that's kind of metal. All right, it's over. I'll move on. Next game. The gang finds a way to free him in exchange for another lead on our rogue mortality. He suggests visiting, and I don't know how to pronounce this name, so I'm gonna make an attempt with visual forked tongue, a cornugan fiend that is essentially cursed to live a charitable life because of Trias. At the crater Fidgel has been banished to, he explains that he used to be a well-respected military leader of sorts until Trias was able to trap him and force him to feel pain upon refusing help to those who ask. So now he just kind of hangs out under some bones and makes his... flaccid... bongs? <laughs> I'm sorry dude, it's a... Uh... It's good to have an outlet. Interestingly, Trius was able to do this by doing something the lawful evil demon never even considered. He lied to him. Vigil wishes he could kill Trius, calls him a betrayer, but doesn't know anything about the Nameless One. However, he does say that he's heard of a place that may be what he's looking for, called the Fortress of Regret. Not to look ahead into the future, but unless I'm mistaken, and I could easily fix this in my own head canon, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense why he'd know about the Fortress of Regret. Even in this dialogue, he doesn't say why it's related to the topic of the Nameless One's mortality. He's just like, hmm, well, I've heard of a place. Even as I'm saying it, I'm realizing just how small an infraction it is, but when you've got so many moving parts in a story and so many of them just work seamlessly, the moment something feels a little off, it's like there's a, a beacon placed on it. Oh, not so perfect now, are we? Oh, how the mighty have fallen. You thought nobody noticed how you... I, you know what, I don't even remember what you did. Are you sure nobody's listening at the door? He doesn't know how to get to the Fortress of Regret, but he'd wager a stack of heads in the plane of Beator would be able to give you directions. Sure enough, over in Hell, there is a disgusting pillar of chattering skulls that collects the heads of those whose lying led to the deaths of others. Before approaching it, it's possible to get Mort to come clean about his origins. All the way, he's been trying to steer the Nameless One away from Beator, but he finally admits that he isn't a mimer. 
a floating sentient encyclopedia what he's claimed to be this whole time. He was a bit of a shithead that wound up on the Pillar of Skulls, until a previous version of the Nameless One agreed to remove him from the Pillar in exchange for information, information that he lost once disconnected from the shared knowledge of the Pillar, meaning he's mostly been following him around because he feels indebted to him, and now also guilty because he in part led to that incarnation's death. So on one hand, I have renewed sympathy for Mort, but on the other, two thirds of this adventure could have been circumvented had he just had a long talk right after the Nameless One woke up in the mortuary. The Pillar of Skulls ain't in the business of handing out info for free and demands a sacrifice. Of course, immediately requesting one of your lady companions. I'm not gonna assume your playstyle, but I will hope you took the most obvious solution to this request and offered yourself to be consumed by the pillar. It doesn't seem to mind that you just appear right in front of it again. What can change the nature of- uh, Updated my journal. Satisfied, the pillar tells of a portal leading to the Fortress of Regret, but says there are only three people who know of its location. The old you, the one who waits there, and Trius, further making it unlikely that Fidgel would know about the Fortress of Regret, but that's fine. The Nameless One wonders why Trius didn't just tell him about the Fortress if he not only knew of it, but knew how to get there. To which the Pillar basically says, yeah, he lied. That's kind of his thing. He's a liar. Don't you know why they call him Trius the Betrayer? This was further foreshadowed in a way that I hadn't even noticed the first time around. If you pay attention to the odd way that Ravel speaks, you'll notice she becomes confused about when she is talking to you. A strange side effect of her fragmented personalities, or branches. The memories of all of them kind of swish around in the pumpkin innards that she calls a brain. She accidentally lets slip things from the past or the future that could easily be confused for homonyms. Just her being a manic pixie dream hag. When she tells the nameless one about Trius, she says he lies, and then corrects herself, lies beyond my keeping. This game is really good at making me feel sort of naive. Two people told me this motherfucker lies, and I still freed him from a prison, and assumed he was on the level, aside from the acerbic tone in which he called calls you mortal. He seems to wield that word like a slur, and I should have just trusted my instincts there. Heading through a portal back to Cursed, the gang arrives to find only a smoldering ruin. It seems as though the town itself, buildings and all, are just gone. In freeing Trius, an alignment shift has occurred, causing Cursed to slide into Carceri. Trius, upset about his imprisonment, surfaced and condemned the town, causing confusion and panic, leading to chaos and evil. The only hope to undo the damage he's done is to defeat him and quell the unrest in the survivors. This includes helping out people scrambling to safety and informing a group of anarchists that are oblivious to the reality that Cursed has become Carceri. Look, guys, Seriously, not right now. This is not the time. Also, please take a shower. When we confront Trius, he's gone mask off, full Deva master race, and claims to not owe a lesser being any answers for his betrayal. Unaware that I am a being scientifically engineered to be good at making people tell me things when I ask, I give him the old puppy dog eyes, the rat boggles, the pleading, begging, please just tell me. I'll s your fing dick. When pressed, he reveals that he's made a deal with the Lower Plains. He would give Cursed to Carceri and in exchange receive an army to attack his homeland. His reasoning concerns the Blood War. He's tired of it and feels as though the bigwigs up in Celestia have been cowering behind their pearly gates, consorting with the enemy, trading weapons with them even, puppeteering an endless war without knowing anything about what it's actually like down in the shit. There are other groups like the Godsmen that with some guilt, aid either side of the blood war, developing weapons in exchange for a little pocket jink, a scenario which mirrors many real life events and brings us perilously close to mixing politics in my games, which cannot be. He's hoping that returning home with an army of nasty dudes will set them straight, force them to act, and finally stamp out evil. Look, we're all thinking it, and I'll take the hit for you. He's gonna... He's going to 9-11 Celestia. 24 sensuous songs on two cassettes for just $14.99, or two compact discs for just- Unable to talk him down, you're forced to fight the Deva. Oh, shit, my dad. 
Upon his defeat, he offers to reveal the location of the portal <coughs> and, uh, shit, I died, to the Fortress of Regret if you spare his life in return. Something you can absolutely follow through with or not, but just know that either way, if Valor is in your party, even if you spare his life and turn to leave, he will kill him anyway. Valor's not so much interested in rehabilitation. I walked away from Trius like, all right, and let that be a lesson. There's always another- <laughs> Oh no! Alright, let's get out of here. Hit the old dusty trail. At the portal to the Fortress of Regret, the Nameless One checks in with his crew to make sure they're all on board with seeing his journey through to the end. Everyone gives their answer, but Mort hesitates and comes clean about some more things he's been keeping to himself. Mainly, he's followed the old version of him into that portal. Though he didn't know what that place was, the two of them wound up there before and it did not go well. The Nameless One, Mort, and three others entered it. They were immediately split up, dropped at different points of a giant plane crawling with shadow creatures, and ultimately, the Nameless One was defeated by the being that lived at its center. Dakon finally admits that he was one of his original group. He's followed multiple incarnations of him, which is why he just started following you, no questions asked. The others were Dianara and a blind archer, who both died in the fortress as well. Despite the doom and gloom of this revelation, Mort offers the caveat that this new version of the Nameless One has more spirit than the last one ever did. He was detached from everything. Through the portal, you are cut off from the rest of your party and met by the ghost of Dianara. She lets you know that in this negative material plane, you are cut off from the other planes. If your immortality functions by stealing the lives of others, and the only other lives here are the friends you brought, they are the pool from which you will be taking life if you die. <laughs> so, needless to say, don't die here. <sighs> As you navigate the dangerous halls of the fortress, making your way closer to its center, we keep cutting back to each of your companions as they are confronted and killed by the Transcendent One. You come to a floating crystal and upon touching it, you are transported into a tiny pocket dimension prison and joined by what appears to be three more yous. Three other incarnations that each made their way to the Fortress of Regret and were stored in this crystal, each of them having their own life experience being the Nameless One, and thus a different personality type. A paranoid one, a practical one, and a good one. The ideal outcome is to convince each of them to merge with you, until you become what passes for whole without a soul. You'll have all your memories returned at least. The paranoid incarnation is the one that left traps and attempted to erase evidence of your previous travels, believing himself to be the only real incarnation and that some fiend has stolen his identity. The practical one is the one to blame for all the awful heartless shit done in our lack of name. Among them, he reveals why he had manipulated Dianara. He knew he could dupe her into dying for him. With her spirit stuck in the Fortress of Regret, she could relate to him how it works and how he could regain his mortality. He also conned Dakon into a scenario where he saved his life and thus, per his people's customs, Dakon owed him a life debt. While convincing the good incarnation to merge with you, you learn that he is the first you, the first nameless one that sought immortality and kicked this whole thing off. Though he seems relatively chill now, apparently many, many years ago, he committed unspeakable crimes. We're talking murders, war crimes, crypto scams, stabbing folks, robbing them, pre-ordering Ubisoft games, practicing black magic, doing that thing where you aggressively cut in front of someone even though we're coming up to a red light anyway, and then you don't even end up going faster than I was when it's green again. Uh, paying for Ubisoft game. He's done so much awful, irredeemable shit that he started to genuinely fear what was going to happen to him when he died. Offering up his answer to Ravel's question, what can change the nature of a man? For him, it is regret. Hoping to avoid an eternity of suffering, he made himself immortal with the intent of buying enough time to undo his past misdeeds. He wanted time to turn his life around and rebalance the scales, but that only led to further torment. A relatively easy thing to miss out on if you don't have the skills for it and you haven't been lugging around that bronze sphere 
that Farad wanted so bad is the revelation as to what it actually is. It turns out it was a sensory stone that the first you made, wherein the nameless one learns his name. It's not shared with us, but he hears it and it provides him with a great deal of comfort. In a symbolic gesture, the named one removes one of his tattoos, a symbol of torment, as it no longer governs his life. In all these versions of the same man, he became many things, a powerful wizard, a prolific thief, a guy that updates his journal, None of them a guy that just goes to therapy, that's for sure. But he's ultimately a spirited, normal man. He's got a normal man's name, probably. Maybe it was Adam. It doesn't matter. He knows himself. Knows, in all capitals, himself. Now that he's got a name for his weird beef jerky body. My guy's moisturizer is made by Jack Lynx. <laughs> I don't know what that means. You have one final conversation with Dianara before she releases you from the crystal prison. You confess up to your former self's crimes, which, though it clearly pains her, she still loves him and hopes that they'll meet in the land of the dead. And I just I wish somebody would tell her that she could do better. At the center of the fortress, surrounded by your fallen chums, you finally face off with the transcendent one. Your own mortality made corporeal. And I guess it just kind of elected to look like this. Maybe it's kind of like the end of Contact, but he was like, I, I hope, hope this, this isn't problematic, but I thought you'd be more comfortable if I looked like a bionicle. When it became separated from you, it gained sentience, wanting to live its own life free from your attempts to merge together again. So it hid away in this fortress and sent shadows after you, not to kill you, but to erase your memory, hoping that if it could erase the trail leading back to it enough, it could live on without your interference. I find it interesting that there aren't exactly alternate endings to this game. There are several ways you can reach the end, variables that can change, characters that can live or die, different ways to trigger the ending, but they do make a hard commitment to the fate of the Nameless One. And the actual final cutscene is a fixed thing that doesn't change. In this confrontation with your mortality, you can fight it to the death, you can convince it to return to your body, you can devise a weapon that is specially imbued with the ability to kill you, and use it on yourself, thus taking your mortality with you. The closest thing to a cheerful conclusion is by combining with your mortality, gaining the power to raise all your companions from the dead, uh, save for the ones that turned against you, of course, where a now full power, full memory, nameless one gives each of them some parting words before accepting his original fate. With his head held high, he lets the fires of hell consume him so that he may clock in his shift at the blood war for maybe forever, maybe not. The multiverse has decided that all his attempts to change his ways for the better was not enough and he'll have to prove himself in the lower planes. Go ahead, send me to hell. I'll only grind harder. Planescape Torment uses the familiar, comfortable confines of an RPG to do so much more than most games of the genre care to do. It wants to explore these unavoidably dark and heavy themes of identity, guilt, punishment, morality, dropping you in a world full of people, figuratively and literally searching for themselves. The Nameless One travels across the plains trying to learn who he is, always in the shadow of this person, while his experiences along the way are actually shaping who he is. His alignment is decided at the end, and that very well could have been on the positive end of the spectrum. But anytime you hear some horror story about a run-in with one of your other incarnations, or meet a former lover that shares some insight about him. It usually sounds distinctly unlike you, because you are effectively a new person. Ravel's question, what can change the nature of a man, has answers spoken in the game, but also has no answer. It's a completely subjective question posed by a cynical mind. In the end, you face a creature that believes the answer is nothing. In truth, the fact that the same man could be molded into several distinctly different people proves that lots of things can change someone. Whether it's love, or revenge, or a rule of threes joke that I will write later. Huh. Guess I never got around to it. There is something bittersweet with this revelation, because it means that the Nameless One might have found a way to atone for his horrible life if he actually tried. Instead of trying to cheat the system, to no-clip his way into heaven. Maybe the only thing that follows each version of the Nameless One is his ability to recruit followers, to find people just as lost as him, and either attempt to help them with their burdens or take advantage of them. All of the followers, capable of change throughout the game, have something, some aspect of themselves they are hiding or repressing. You know, more 
lies and says he's a mimer out of guilt for leading a previous incarnation to his death. Anna, who has hardened herself from a life on the streets, living as a tiefling, a race that many see as lesser, as more of a beast than a human, can't bear to admit that she loves the Nameless One because she knows that the end of this story is his death, so she clumsily tries to stifle that feeling to protect herself. Fall from Grace is a living contradiction, a being that by nature is of a chaotic evil alignment, but lives a new life as lawful neutral. She can still see the appeal, the elegance of evil, but has chosen to abstain from it. Dakon was a leader to his people. He freed them from slavery at the hands of the Mind Flayers, and now he lives essentially as an indentured bodyguard to a guy that ain't even the same guy no more. It's all so human. Doesn't matter that characters have tails or wings or they speak in fantasy jargon, they are complicated and paradoxical. It's kind of like how I spend so much of my life playing video games, yet also see gamers as subhuman. There are several characters who have lost their name, had a defining part of themselves stolen or broken, and seek only the comfort of knowing themselves. Even in the text, like the font, the word know or knowing is always emphasized, taking on this exaggerated significance. Dakon does this a lot. I'd imagine because he comes from a world where knowing oneself is what creates them. Through concentration, they can manipulate the matter of their world, like his sword that is constantly changing shape, which kind of off topic, but the description of the sword was fascinating to me. It's like instead of the scene cutting to Dakon to get his read of a situation, it would just cut to what his sword was doing. My imagination went wild trying to put into images how this thing works, but I'm sure if they actually just showed a clear image of it, it, it would be kind of silly and not nearly as surreal. Oh, okay, well, I, I guess that's it then. Fuck me, I guess. Just fuck me then. F just fuck me. Do not turn the VCR off yet. This is a special section of the tape for Dragon Masters only. I am HFO. Planescape scores big points with me for being a small, focused story in a massive and endlessly intriguing world. It's a, it's a grand fucking toy box, and an indifferent one at that, even though the Nameless One has somehow unlocked the secret of immortality. The multiverse doesn't give a shit. Big picture, you're not facing gods. The fate of everything doesn't hinge on whether or not you ask someone an insightful question. Your goal isn't saving your wife or avenging your wife or killing your wife, it's an introspective and philosophical pursuit in a massive, uncaring world. You don't even meet the fucker that owns this place. Well, I mean, maybe you do if you try praying to her a bunch of times, and even then she shows up for like five seconds to be like, all right, you, out of here, in the maze, let's go. It's not like you talk to her or do any kind of quest involving her or really learn anything else about her. Why would you? You're just some asshole, and that's beautiful. I love that. I get the appeal of the power fantasy that comes with other CRPGs, the hero warship, where you spend the length of a game growing from a plucky level 1 warrior in a cloth sack to a level 10 blood-soaked murder wizard, the skulls of kobolds crushed with every step. But that character and their pursuits are not going to linger in my mind. I'm not going to empathize with that on nearly the same level or have my heart broken by it. Well, you know what? I'll walk that back. I know me. Take it or leave it, I think a big reason it's so engaging and memorable is in part due to torment making the characters characters and not portrait images with canned backstories. So it certainly deals a blow to your role playing capabilities, but it's for a good reason. It allows the Nameless One and his followers to have a greater degree of depth and sort of interlocking plot lines. Characters are deep-rooted in Planescape. When you dig through each of the followers' backstories, you'll find that their lives crisscross with the threads of the main plot, their arcs tied up with the Nameless One and his journey, even if it wasn't so obvious at the start. For a while, I would be surprised when something small linked back to my quest revealed some morsel of exposition, but after a while, I had to acknowledge that the whole game was just consistently wound together with its ideas, and I'm unfortunately not really used to that. It's very infrequent that you'll run across something that exists as a non-sequitur, and could easily be cut and pasted into another RPG. I also find it admirable how much it tries to deconstruct familiar ideas found in the RPG and the dungeon crawler, and I don't mean to put all of the weight of that on planescape as an RPG setting, because as it existed, 
It was already plenty interesting, but the story written for this game doesn't squander that. It could have easily copped out and let the lore do the heavy lifting, but the story within it is nearly as ambitious and heady, weaving important elements of Planescape into it, like the Blood War, Sigil's factions, the wonder and absurdity of walking the plains. At nearly every turn, it approaches a trope and then subverts it. I see this in something like Dianara, who is a type of character you've probably seen in fantasy media at some point. The ghost of a star-crossed lover, guiding and haunting the hero on his journey. But in Planescape, this relationship is completely one-sided. The Nameless One doesn't know who the fuck this lady is. And worse, the version of him that did brutally took advantage of her. He was everything to her, and he could barely stand being in her presence. It's really sad and engaging, even in this game where you play a guy that can wield his own arm as a weapon and pull out and replace his eyeballs or tear off his tattoos and staple new ones on. These are just nicely fleshed out characters. Nobody seems like a stock inclusion. Hey, well, you gotta have this type of dude. We got a bunch of weirdos. Even Anna, who is arguably the most normal of the bunch, has a well-defined personality and it's hugely entertaining to see her deal with difficult things as stone-faced as she can but then slowly start to let her guard down. I will say, obviously Torment is a game that excites me, it captures my imagination, and even though I've done a lot of groveling at its feet for most of the video, it is not perfect, it is not flawless, it has some dialogue that isn't great, some quests that end rather anticlimactically, some themes that are short shrifted compared to others, and on top of that, it breaks into a sprint at its third act, losing much of the explorative joy of the first two. I can look past a lot of that because there is ultimately more good than bad, I would say. There is so much here that just mathematically, not all of it can receive the same amount of consideration. Also, if I may, Don the armor of a white knight for but a moment, milady. There are some things in this game that kind of creep me out, and I'll admit there is outside influence to a few of these things. I'd be lying if I said that the vision statement from earlier wasn't still floating around in the back of my head. And I know there are justifications for that. I've lived through the 90s and 2000s and seen nothing wrong with how the video game industry treated women. Of course, I was a child with a spherical brain through most of that. I can foresee many saying the phrase I've used as a meme. It was the 90s. That's how you got a game made back then. They were just putting on a show so they'd get funding. Yeah, I know that. Yes, these are true statements, but that doesn't make it any less of a bummer that there was and still is that inherent sexism in the game industry. Maybe it was more blatant back then, but it still exists. It's just learned to embed itself deeper. And it would be one thing if all that horny nerd baiting about being an irresistible babe magnet was just for show, the dirty part of the business. Uh, but when I think about it, the nameless one is like the gamer dream become reality. He's stinky, smelly, he's got brain damage, he's probably never even seen grass, let alone touched it, and yet everyone in this game wants to fuck him. There are women in this game that have, I would say, very engaging, well-written dialogue. Ravel Puzzlewell is a fascinating character, and her big scene in this game was probably my favorite part. That doesn't change that she, like every other woman in the game, just lives for this fucking guy, defined by his effect on them. There's plenty of moments in Torment that just kind of assume the type of person playing the game, which feels out of sync with the rest of it. And look, Torment isn't the most romantic game. I can see a clear intention to step away from these idealized depictions of love, which is interesting. Love is often complicated or tragic, and I think that is expressed pretty clearly, which makes Anna and Fall From Grace stand out against the philosophy of the game, as a Betty and Veronica love triangle is an established trope, and it isn't subverted in any meaningful way. It's most assuredly more toned down than other RPGs, but you can still flirt with them and kiss both of them. They express jealousy at each other. And on top of that, the language used when talking to them is very fixated on how hot you think they are. For Anna, it's also in a literal sense. Her fiendling blood makes her body temperature run really hot, which gamers are very quick to throw out as an explanation for her revealing outfit. Something I find more depraved than just admitting you like the big-titted lady. I think Anna's outfit 
would matter less to me if the game didn't go out of its way to describe her as not being an adult. On the brink of womanhood was the quote, I believe. This is a character written to unchangeably be romantically interested in you. Yeah, things don't get taken as far as in a Bioware game, but I still think you can do enough that the Nameless One should be put on some kind of registry. Literally, why does that have to be written? You could literally just not say that. But they chose to say that, and that's kind of fucking weird. That's the point of this entire aside. There's just shit here that makes me say, huh, a bit sus amogus. Then I start fixating on other things. The wizard that disguises himself as an armoire in order to spy on women and house their underwear. Something that, honestly, could be funny in another timeline where I trusted its authors. I'm gonna set my armor back down. All right. Whew. Oh man. Heavy ways, the helmet. Hey, but you know what? To get back to praising it for things, it can be a funny game. It's brimming with dark humor and uses the surreal nature of the planes to come up with really silly and occasionally meta scenarios you can find yourselves in. Not so much like Fallout 2, where I feel like they could have benefited from turning the ha ha he he dial down like one or two notches, or at the very least, the pop culture reference dial. I don't actually recall many pop culture references. I'm positive they are there but they likely went over my head. The only one I definitely picked up on was at one point, the nameless one has the option to say, you've forgotten the face of your father, a recurring phrase in the Dark Tower books, which is downright obscure in comparison to some bits in the Fallout games, which I love, but I can only point at the screen so many times. Something I had been mulling over was, I think there is a lot of great material that could be kept from you depending on your play style, and a lot that you could be unknowingly locked out of experiencing. I don't really take this as a fault of the game. If anything, you could interpret that as a positive, making the game worth more than one playthrough, but I could imagine a lot of gamers going into it and playing it in such a way that they miss what I find to be vitally important bits of lore. One of the bigger ones hinges on whether or not the player thought to lug around an item they get pretty early on. Since some non-essential quest items tend to linger in your inventory, it wouldn't be out of the question that someone just tossed it out and replaced it with more sweet, sweet silver rings to keep forgetting to sell. Well, once I've transferred everything to all my followers and we're all packed tight, we're gonna hit that marketplace. This is a game that has long been hailed as having maybe the best story ever in a game. I'm not the kind of person that could easily and confidently proclaim anything the best anything or the worst anything. So I'm not going to say Planescape Torment is the best story in a game ever. The way I see it is that it's also kind of unreplicable. Hard to find comparisons beyond Disco Elysium, which I find to be closer to a contemporary than even its spiritual successor. Tides wanted to do Planescape again, which I understand, but I think when people say they want another Torment, they aren't quite literally saying, I want Torment again if that makes sense. Disco Elysium borrows notes of torment, uses the same keys to play a different melody. A man filled with regret loses his identity and has a chance to start over as a new person, to reinvent himself while walking through this catalog of his transgressions. In Planescape it might be, you screwed someone over, killed someone, or just scared them. In Disco Elysium it might be that you got drunk and trashed a hotel bar, or crashed your police car. Either way, you are shaped and changed by seeing the misery this past self brought to others. You don't have to be Harry, you could be Tequila Sunrise. You don't have to be Nameless One, you could be Adam should you wish it. And more importantly to me, both games highlight and make significant little things within a larger world. Even in a world full of supernatural wonder, brutal warfare, and things that threaten the balance of life itself, the things that stay with you are small, like a gesture that suggests you've earned your partner's respect. Both depict a world I desperately want to learn more about and feature deeply human characters, populating a story full of emotional resonance and intrigue, as well as more surreal or cerebral concepts. And both have two leads that, no matter how much you yell at your screen, simply refuse to fuck each other. 
You're likely to see Planescape Torment shuffled amidst other CRPGs. Your Baldur's Gate, your Neverwinter's Night, and Icewind's Dale. If you've played a game like that before going into Torment, expecting it to be like that, after all, it is using the Infinity Engine, well, simply put, it is not quite like that. Visually, it looks like it should be, and it does implement the second edition D&D rule set. But Planescape was being made around the same time as Baldur's Gate, and doesn't actually have the other, more mechanically complete RPGs to use as reference. It took the beginnings of that game engine, and splintered off into its own narrative-focused thing. So this game shares about as much DNA with other CRPGs as it does with Grim Fandango. Like, you know, kinda. At the character creation screen, the only thing we can alter are your six abilities. And though you start out as a fighter, you can later swap your class to wizard or thief. This is handled really informally. There are just characters you'll do a side quest for that are unrelated to them being a trainer of some kind, and they will thank you by saying, hey, I'm a trainer. If you ever want to be a wizard, hit me up. And there's no pressure to commit to that for the whole game. At the start, your alignment is true neutral, but your actions will move this alignment across the spectrum of good v evil and chaos v law. And I should add, although you are essentially deciding your alignment by your actions, it's not as though you're presented with a dialogue prompt that says chaotic or good in parentheses or something. It's all stuff embedded in the story, happening behind the scenes and you don't always know what the result of your actions will be, what kind of energy that puts out into the world, or how your followers, who each have their own set of principles and ethics, will react. What does sometimes appear in parentheses are the intent of words. You can often say the same line honestly or as a lie, a bluff, and that will affect alignment appropriately. You could say something like, yeah, I could rescue your cat, or yeah, I could rescue your cat, or yeah, I could rescue your cat, or yeah, I could rescue your cat. You know what I mean? One has an honest intention, which is good. One is a bluff that might be chaotic. One is a lie because you don't intend to, which could be evil. Uh, and I don't know what the last one implies. I guess it sounds unlawful. I'll admit there are flaws in the gameplay, and it's likely what will turn you away if you were hoping to experience something beyond a really good story. If you look up just about any discourse on the game, you'll no doubt hear things like, it would have been better off as a novel. It's the best novel ever written. Just read this novel someone cobbled together by transcribing a let's play. Or that the gameplay is so awful and aged that it ruins the experience entirely. Unplayable, you'll hear, despite people regularly replaying it successfully. And if that is your perspective, that is valid. It's stupid, and there will always be a part of me that frankly thinks lesser of you, but your opinion is so fucking valid. I see you, king, queen, or envy of royalty, with just the worst taste humanly possible. It just... Some games are just good games and you get, there's like no fighting. One thing that without fail will come up, and I'm guilty of it as well, is advising or warning a new player that really there are only three abilities. Intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. The reason for this is that due to much of Torment's action and stat checks taking place in dialogue, it's only logical that you would want to focus on raising abilities that would unlock more dialogue options. It's a talking game. You want to be the best talker. Like Fallout's 1 and 2, many things that would otherwise result in combat can be resolved in dialogue through storytelling and that's what the game excels at. I agree that this is how you will get the most out of Torment your first go around. Obviously you don't need to do that. You can dump points into whatever you want and that could lead to some unique experiences. But I would say it's true that the best parts of the game are sort of gate kept and reserved for smooth talk and magic users. Since combat isn't the focus of the game, it is relatively simple and most fights can be taken care of just by clicking once on an enemy and letting your little dudes whack away. Even with a wizard build, you don't really have to bother with spells and you can have Dakon or Fall from Grace deal with that while you just break people with a club. Something I don't take issue with, but as I understand it, everyone has some arbitrary level of combat depth that decides whether they are playing a video game 
or reading a book. Fights also end pretty quickly, unless you're fighting an enemy that flees, then you might be watching these dum-dums run in circles until they get cornered. Fighting larger groups of enemies, or bigger boss-type characters, can be a little more involved, and may require you to pause time and distribute healing items and set up spells. Visually, the use of spells is modeled after the Final Fantasy games, but mechanically, they are beholden to an older edition of D&D, where you need to first choose spells to memorize, and rest to memorize them before you are able to use them. Again, it's not mind-blowing or particularly interesting stuff, or even good maybe, but it's part of a greater whole. It's also not a game that emphasizes loot. You'll find loot, and aside from money or a spell, a lot of it is junk that you could stuff into your pockets to sell, but aside from the Nameless One's tattoos, which you just unlock and purchase, you won't be swapping out your weapons and armor all that often. Some characters, barely at all. This makes it kind of exciting when you do find an equipment upgrade, and it's usually tied to a quest. It seems like this was very intentionally done, as the game also goes out of its way to parody the dungeon crawler gameplay tropes. This is seen in a side quest involving a mechanical pocket dimension in which a dungeon crawler game is procedurally generated, with plenty of neat but useless and worthless items to collect. If you find anything worth anything, it's gonna have a bunch of stats and requirements and a pamphlet concerning its provenances. And it's always something weird, like a ring that passed through the colon of a demon prince or some shit, thus making the wearer everlastingly regular. Even playing through twice, I know there is still so much shit I didn't get to, or options I didn't try, and unsurprisingly it's usually things that a more evil or chaotic character would get mixed up in. But I have a real tough time committing to an evil playthrough, especially in a game like this, because your followers don't follow you down the same alignment path. They stick to their convictions, and will leave if they get fed up with you, or try to fight you if you push them far enough. And I just couldn't do that to these dummies, not even Ignis, even though my first interaction with him was watching his girlfriend disintegrate into his arms. I still just... I, did, I didn't want to ruin the vibe, you know? While some of the more hardcore, masochistic, step on my type gamers could take the idea of your player character not being able to die as a detriment to satisfying or challenging gameplay. And I don't mean to dismiss its gameplay along with its strengths and weaknesses, but just to reiterate, if you're not interested in diving into a game with a rich story and world as its centerpiece, then this simply might not be it for you. Because everything, including death, is in service to that. When you die in combat, you just kind of wake up on one of few slabs you may have been dragged to, with no other discernible punishment. In many cases, you will allow yourself to die or kill yourself to advance the plot to problem solve, or just for the sake of a goof. There's a lot of wild shit you could pull off with the ability to die and resurrect. I think I'd mainly use it to get out of plans. Like if I had to... I don't have any plans. Many glowing reviews of this game are sure to posit that looking at Planescape Torment is rough, its age is difficult to reconcile, and even at the time it wasn't anything to write home about. I mean, the game came out in 99, the same year as Shenmue, and that game looked different, but Counterpoint, this game looks fantastic, especially now that you can play it in widescreen. To have your whole screen filled with Planescapes, fascinating pre-rendered isometric environments, it's just, oh, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, it's great. A lost art, like seeing a poorly taken care of painting restored to its former glory, a Jesus newly rendered as an amusing potato man. All at once, barbaric, medieval, and modern, where one moment you'll come across huts constructed out of planar junk, and the next you'll find an elegant Rococo palace. This philosophy sort of extends to character design, as you're given one of the most strange collections of dudes in a game. And I think it was wise of Black Isle to refrain from including the more common races seen in the popular D&D settings, like Forgotten Realms. So you won't come across Tolkien races like elves and dwarves. If it's not a dragon man or a centaur, then you're chatting up a smelly, dirt-covered human. Just a filthy man. Unless you're a lady and then you're a bodacious babe in like some kind of heavy metal getup. There are later areas with less inspired art direction, but I'm just enamored by this engine and the atmosphere it oozes. Even the UI seems 
homogenous with the rest of its design. It's like this wacky steamwork machine with a unique layout. Tons of buttons, some of which I pressed, others I dare not. Aside from the opening and closing cutscenes and some establishing shots, any significant visual is going to be described to you, making cutscenes essentially a text experience. I think this works in the game's favor, it lets your imagination run wild, and everything is so artfully described, I just ate up every word of it. Not saying I would have minded if there were more cutscenes though, because the ones we have are charming in that chunky kind of way. Oh, speaking of chunky, let's get into it. You guessed it, the rat roundup. <laughs> Well, it should come as no surprise that Planescape is a game lousy with rats, the majority of which are hostile, which is, let's be honest, less than ideal. But that's okay, it's not a lost cause, because thankfully just the presence of rats earns you high marks in this analysis. If you squint hard enough, you can see these are rather cute. Chubby little rats, even with weird pulsating exposed brains, they make great squeaking noises, and there are a heck of a lot of them. This is actually, in a neat way, another example of how Planescape turns RPG tropes on their head. How many times has your first quest been to clear out a cellar of rats? Or some such fucking shit ass bullshit? Well, in this game, the humble rat is actually a formidable opponent when in a group. They can pool their energy to cast spells, which can one-shot you to death. You gotta love it. On top of that, we got were rats, which were very intimidating and frankly had me running for the door. But from what I could see, they looked like very good rats making Planescape the recipient of my highest rat roundup rating. Good! What really makes the vibe of Planescape, and specifically Sigil, memorable, is how its visuals are melded with sound. The street ambience in this game is fantastic, and areas sound distinct and full of life. It's dense with idle chatter, alien creatures, vendors shouting like carnival barkers, hawking their goods. Jellied Hydra eyeballs in aspic. Give it a try, it's delicious. One that sticks out to me is the guy ranting about Ignis in the smoldering corpse bar, advertising an eternally burning wizard like a freak show. Come on in, buy him a drink, he's thirsty, he's burning up and we've done nothing to stop his agony. Come inside, piss on him, I don't even know what that will do. Top to bottom, I like all the sound design here. If I had any complaints, it's that every now and then, there will be one sound effect mixed way louder than everything else. Usually some kind of spell sound, and it never failed to jump scare me. So much so that it began angering me. You ever have a noise that just comes to anger you? Updated my journal. Not that one, that one's good. It's still good. I think as far as voice acting is concerned, this is ideal for me with a CRPG. No doubt done out of budgetary and time constraints given it's got a word count higher than the Bible. Voice acting is limited to a handful of lines, mostly around important plot developments. Everyone gets just enough lines so their tone and accent buries itself in your mind and you can fill in the rest. Probably not the most popular opinion, but were every line of dialogue voiced, it would commit to one one inflection, one read of it, that could change how you feel about them. On the other hand, given the talent they got for this handful of lines, I wouldn't mind a reality where it was fully voiced. Lots of talent brought in from Baldur's Gate and Fallout 2, many accomplished voice actors and a few wild cards in the bunch. Mort is played by Rob Poulsen, who has seemingly been in every bit of animated media ever, amassing over 500 credits. Mort, like Latin. For death. Fall from Grace is voiced by Jennifer Hale, a powerful voice in gaming. Bastila, Femshep, Ash from Overwatch, or as it is known these days, Overwatch 2. Try to arise over the merely carnal and see the universe for more than it is. In a wild get, Anna is voiced by Scottish pop star of the 80s and 90s, Sheena Easton. You may know her from such horny hits as The Lover in Me and Sugar Walls. <laughs> which I assume is about building a gingerbread house. Though why would you spend the night inside them? Must be up to interpretation. I can't find any daters. Maybe I can gut a Dusty. Dakon is voiced by Mitch Pelegi in what may be his only non-X-Files related video game appearance. And just like the X-Files, he fucking nails it. Endure. In enduring, grow strong. Keith David plays Valor 
and is a delight to hear in any game. The hand of justice shall not be stayed. Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson, plays Nordum, a secret character that you have to accomplish a sizable hidden side quest to unlock. Nordum and Crossbows wish to go in search of trouble. The Transcendent One is played by the late Tony J who for a long time was hired anytime anyone needed some kind of narrator or omnipotent god figure. I will no longer play with you. Prepare to suffer. Trius is played by John Delancey, who you might know as Q from the Star Trek media empire. What is it you wish of me, mortal? Speak your mind and leave me to my memories of paradise. It's a lot. A lot of names in there, and not a weak link among them. Of course, doing much of the heavy lifting is probably the least known name on this call sheet, and that's Michael Weiss as the Nameless One. The one who is gone. The one what updated his journal. Doesn't have much to say, but the things he does say, he sure says a lot, and I respect that. Torment has a great soundtrack with a bit of an unfortunate backstory. It was composed by Mark Morgan, who had just before worked on both Fallout games. It's a wonderful mix of classic movie score type stuff, but there's also more organic, tribal elements, eastern influences. It sounds worldly and unplaceable for the most part. It's also got this recurring motif that I guess is like the de facto theme song, and it's a real earworm. It's all enjoyable, and especially when it's layered on top of the bed of ambience each level has. It's like a ready-made tabletop RPG soundtrack. I can totally see myself rolling dice, making notes, falling into pits, trying to climb out of pits, falling back into pits. The strange thing about it was that this soundtrack was a last-minute replacement to another soundtrack that was well underway. One they had tapped industrial artist Lustmord to create. Six weeks before the game was to launch, the Interplay producer he had been working with and who had been enthusiastic about the soundtrack was replaced by another. One who requested that all the music he produced over the span of four months be scrapped and remade to be more generically fantasy sounding. In an interview years later, Lustmord would recall this as a very unpleasant experience, in part because of the oppressive and corporate atmosphere after the producer was replaced. They requested the new soundtrack be more in line with the work of John Williams, to which he suggested they hire John Williams. In the end he wasn't even paid, remarking, I got fucked over. Even though this soundtrack wouldn't see the light of day, there are remnants of it. A lot of it was repurposed into his album Metavoid, which as it stands would be a fine soundtrack to many things, but in a more pure form you can hear it on a cinematic trailer that was included on Fallout discs. And it is a different vibe, it's a little darker and creepier, but not ill-fitting. Some of these trailers also include bits of cutscenes that were not included in the final game, making them an interesting look at what could have been. Had Interplay remembered that their name is Interplay, not Interfere. <coughs> uh, so I love the soundtrack we got, but I would have also loved to see what a full Lost Mord soundtrack would be like, especially after listening to the Stalker-inspired album he did. I mean, really, when you get down to it, I would just like more Planescape game. It's wild that it's just been sort of abandoned as a setting, despite being tethered to what many consider one of the best games ever made. A good deal of what allows some of these ideas to work in Planescape are the planes and all of their quirks. You'd think someone would want to develop that further, but they're too afraid. A bunch of cowering leatherheads that were too worried about the jink in their purses. If you ask me, the sod should be scragged and put on the leafless tree. Their names marked in the dead book. Look how fun it is. All these words and more could be yours. <laughs> When looking up critical player reviews for Planescape, especially on a platform like GOG, where you'd think it would be closer to its target audience, there's a bit to wade through. For one thing, ironically amid countless reviews, 
derisively calling it a book, saying things like, might as well be a book, or would have been better as a book. A lot of people seem to spend the length of a book writing something that could have been summed up as, I can't read. So there were quite a few that I got the gist of from the first sentence and it would have just eaten up this entire segment. The other thing to navigate was something I had to do a little internet forensics to understand, uncovering a forgotten controversy. But I guess any product released by Beamdog, the studio releasing these enhanced editions of Infinity engine games is in recovery from being review bombed for a number of reasons, all of which seem like nonsense to me and aren't as interesting to cover. Honestly, I don't know a lot about Beamdog. I guess they're made up of ex-Bioware staff and maybe they are the devil. Bioware proper has certainly done things I'm not a fan of, but I don't give a shit about a different studio selling old games. If this is how people are exposed to these older games, then fine. As absurd as it may seem to the terminally online, the average Joe gamer doesn't want to hunt down a disc or an ISO and its corresponding patches. They want to click a play button and then play the game. If this is how we preserve them, again, fine. I only see that as a positive. So in these comments, there are camps of people, some positively seething, that a new studio would deem themselves worthy enough to slap their name on Baldur's Gate, and the enhanced edition's new features and content have ruined the game. This seemed to hit a high in 2016 after they released a new DLC called Siege of the Dragon Spear, an entirely new expansion to a 20-year-old game, and its greatest sins seem to include attempting to add depth to characters that had none, adding a single trans woman NPC, and one joke that dunked on Gamergate, something I think they should have stuck to their guns on, but they wound up removing shortly after the backlash. So when this reactionary sect of uber nerds complained about this to Beamdog en masse, they issued a statement on their forum that the Gamergate line would be removed and asked if you liked the game, they would be appreciative if you left a positive review to mitigate some of the review bombing. A request that poked the hive further as now they were claiming that Beamdog, haven of woke communist SJWs, was begging people for positive reviews to revive their failing liberal agenda game. So even reviews for Planescape are filled with this same vitriol, referencing this whole Baldur's Gate fiasco they invented. It's honestly a demoralizing glimpse into a real sad world people live in. One of the first things that came up when I looked into this was a video, firstly, with a slur in its title, where some gamer just makes his party attack the trans character. Like, do you realize how fucked in the head you have to be to take time out of your fleeting, pathetic life to do that and upload it and think I'm on the right side of history? Yes, I've made the world a better place now. They'll sing songs of me someday. I realize the whole business of the video essay is best enjoyed when the author has some kind of strong opinion, positive or negative. More so negative, I'd imagine. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this part of the video. But like, just how? How could someone fucking care about any of this? It just doesn't compute with me. Just imagine. Imagine caring that a little pixel person in a DLC to a 20 year old game says when I was born my parents thought me a boy. Whereupon you go, I see. Well, see you later. And then just pissing yourself. Just yelling, uh oh, and evacuating your bladder. Insane. Anyway, let's piss ourselves over some reviews, eh? If only it was a book, I would give 10 out of 10. The main problem of Planescape Torment is that it's a game. Let's put the story plot aside. Gameplay-wise, it didn't age well. It's just boring to play. All those battles and running around the same places over and over again are no fun. It only annoys and distracts you from the story. Seriously, if you seek for such stories, read some books. Uh, and then he lists some books. Since there is a lot of this, I'm just gonna blanket state my opinion for this sentiment. I don't think Planescape should be a book. I don't think a Planescape book, which does exist, or any book really, would be a market replacement for the video game Planescape Torment. It's a game that has a plot, gameplay, exploration, atmosphere, and design with a unifying theme about identity and choice, changing the nature of a man. It is important to it as an idea that you are shaping the protagonist through your input. You would not be getting the same experience of playing Planescape Torment by just reading it. Even if it was some elaborate, ambitious, choose your own adventure book. I just don't find this to be a constructive criticism in any way. Even when you do what this guy did and list the names of some books, there's nothing you could include in review like this that would make me think you've ever read a fucking book. One of the worst RPG games I have played. 
I tried several times to play this game, even on the easy difficulty settings, and I still died numerous times. I have attempted the game recently as well and had the same issues. For me, this game was a waste of money, and I would suggest for those looking to play this game to try and find a demo first. Did you pick up that tidbit in the plot? It may have been buried in there, but they hint ever so subtly that your player character is immortal, so he can never truly die. You know what I mean? You notice how when you die, you just kind of wake up later? You notice that? That's because you can't really die, so it's not much of a problem, is it? Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna be okay, aren't you? You want some food before you get grumpy? Yeah? You want McDonald's? You want some fries? You want some soggy little fries? <laughs> Might have been good before they had books, but nowadays, there is no reason to put up with the dated gameplay, where there are much better story options like reading. Don't believe me? According to Steam achievements, only half of players even leave the first area of the game, and the percentages only drop off more and more after that. Less than 10% manage to actually finish the game. I guess the nostalgia wasn't strong enough. You think this has dated gameplay? Try reading a book. Doesn't even have quick saves. Unless you have a bookmark. Fuck. Never mind. I don't get the point you're trying to make in the second half. Like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that people have shitty taste in video games. When someone has to ask how to get out of the first room, you know there's a problem with this game. Maybe the developers should make some changes so that people don't have to mind read to play this game. Don't buy. Buddy, the majority of what you do in this game is talk to people. If you're not doing that, then yeah, it might be hard to know what you're supposed to do. But you don't have to mind read, you just have to eyes read. Eight hours in and I have yet to discover what is supposedly so amazing about this game. One, scour screen for named character. Two, talk to named character. You know, at one point, I didn't want to move on to the next area just yet, so I just took some time exploring some options I had ignored, and I wound up in a curio shop, where I for no real reason purchased an enchanted item called the Codex of the Inconceivable. And when you read it, the Nameless One reacts as though he's just seen the most amazing thing in his entire life. And Mort's like, what's in there, Chief? What is it? And he's just like, I can't believe it. It's, wow, I just... And it's essentially just a joke item, because nobody can actually describe what's in it. I found a completely optional, useless thing to laugh at by wandering around and trying things. I don't know, I guess I mean to say, you sort of get out of the game what you put in. If you don't buy into the world and story of this story-driven game, then you're not gonna enjoy the base mechanics of it. Too old and ugly! Wish I had my 20 back. It pleases me to see that you were unable to refund this beautiful looking game and you lost $20. Seethe. Cope. Piss even. I spent three hours reading dialogue and dying repeatedly. No penalty for dying, you just have to walk all the way again. No progress made since going out of the crypt. Shit game, go buy DOS or something. Ignore overhyped comments others made. This game has little to no gameplay at all and the story is mediocre at best. For the same amount of money, you can get modern games with all the better gameplay and better writing than this trash. I can't say anything good about this game. It has no redeeming quality at all. The music is mediocre, combat is point and click. The quest activities are like the ones found Ubisoft games, but less engaging. To illustrate, this game is like controlling two basic units in an RTS game, since you have two characters at the start, with no abilities at all. So combat is click here and there until either you die or the enemy dies, then proceed. You get chunks of text to read every now and then, but the plot is not interesting. You wake up with a floating skull beside you and you get out of the mortuary. Then you have to find the person written in your back. There's absolutely no incentive to proceed after leaving the first area, since it does not tell you why you should care about proceeding, and the game is tedious enough to warrant quitting after a few hours. Too long didn't read. This is not a game just an overrated wall of text. If that's your thing, go get a visual novel or get a decent RPG. This is definitely the worst game I have played in my Steam account. I highly recommend buying something like Pillars of Eternity or DOS and never waste money on this shit. Yeah, there's no penalty because you're immortal and you use death to your advantage. It's part of the gameplay. I'm fine with a review that criticizes the combat. It is undercooked especially considering its proximity to Baldur's Gate and Fallout 2. That is something that absolutely could have been improved. But to say there is little to no gameplay is a silly and incorrect thing to say. I honestly don't think you could, for the same money, get a modern game with a story comparable to Torment. I think that is genuinely not true. I mean, maybe if Disco Elysium is on sale. I'm sorry, I'm just realizing my age here. I didn't know that DOS probably meant Divinity Original Sin and not MS-DOS. 
Then I became dust and was carried away on a strong breeze. Your inability to say anything good about this game reads to me like the words of a contrarian, which I empathize with. I sometimes get overly defensive or skeptical when someone recommends me a game. When they presume to know what a good game is, what a game I would like is, and I've likely deprived myself many enjoyable experiences because of that. This is a stretch, bordering on bait. What do you mean there's no incentive to continue beyond the mortuary? You're telling me if you woke up one day with a tattoo you don't remember having that had instructions on it, you'd just shrug and carry on with your stupid life? Spent a few minutes with it and got a huge headache just by looking at the graphics. You can't go into first person or even third person in this game. It's all top down and there's no voice acting at all. It's it's a bunch of reading about absolutely nothing. A total failure to engage a gamer in a meaningful way, and anyone who says they enjoy this game is probably lying. You're gonna be livid when you realize there are whole genres set in this perspective, and have been since the dawn of gaming. It sounds like we're at some kind of a ideological impasse here, so I'm not gonna try to get you to like this game. I, I do honestly think that you should delete this though, because it's... It's not good, man. It's not good. Likely nothing I just said for the past five hours was some out of left field hot take. Lots of people love this game. It's not starved for affection. I do think more people should finish it though. I think it was probably starved for affection when it came out, which is why there is only one of them. But enough time has passed for history to decide that this is regarded, you know, almost universally as a good game. As more people are manufactured and further removed from Planescape Torment, I do notice an uptick in negativity regarding it. It's by no means a large demographic, but a loud one that is eager to dismiss it for requiring you to read and feeling its age as far as gameplay goes. I don't mean to imply it's archaic or unplayable, as reviews are likely to say, I just mean that games from this era tended to play like this. And if you don't have patience for that, there is little else I can do to persuade you it's worth playing. But I think everyone should give it a shot. I'm a big fan of dumb games. Games with heart and no brains, of course. But would absolutely suggest if you want to experience an expertly written story that makes near-perfect use of the CRPG in a charming world that is very little I'd consider an equal on that front, then this is the game. It's the only one. I bet if you looked up games with storytelling like Torment, or just games like Torment, you'd get a bunch of understandable but inaccurate guesses, listing other D&D games, other games with Chris Avalon's involvement, or just more modern RPGs that were well liked for their narrative, and that's all well and good, but I still think something different entirely. I don't have a great answer as to what specific thing makes Torment Torment and how you provide an experience like it. Maybe it's having a well-realized and complex setting. Maybe it's having an emotionally resonant and inventive storyline, a sardonic sense of humor, a degree of self-awareness, or an emphasis on choice and exploration, character development. I don't know, maybe it's just the act of nailing all of those things at once, which it kinda does. Well, it's not something my brain can allow me to just be blasé about. Because it has problems. Beyond things that are the result of my own woke and thus brokedom, there are things that feel rushed, themes it stumbles with, things that feel incongruous with the rest, pacing issues, and some moments that felt like they should have had more fanfare, but ultimately just kind of stop like an awkward edit. You'd think freeing a gigantic metal golem convinced its purpose is to serve entropy, to unmake the multiverse, would result in, I don't know, maybe a cutscene, something other than just fading to black and sprinkling XP on me. Let's go! Entropy, baby! Oh. Thankfully, there is enough good in this game that still makes me feel like it is, in its own way, a little miracle. Or more like an anomaly. A freak. All throughout my pondering of this game, there was this invasive thought in the back of my head. This rock I was avoiding kicking over, perhaps out of reverence for torment, and it became more noticeable the more times I found myself referencing Disco Elysium. Do I like 
one more than the other. At some point, subconsciously, did my fondness for Torment get overthrown by another game? Indulging in that thought, I came to feel as though maybe it's more that Disco Elysium did fewer things wrong using Torment as a roadmap. It understood what worked about Torment and only did those things. Because Torment was tethered to the rules and expectations of Dungeons and Dragons, it unwisely kept in a bunch of things that don't line up with the game they wanted to make. I'd imagine if Zeb Cook were allowed to make the standalone Planescape game he was brought in for, then it might have been more comparable to what Boulder's Gate became, just a worthy reflection of a tabletop game and one of its campaign settings. But Torment unexpectedly had to pull double duty, being the flagship and also this oddball side project marred by leftovers, D&D detritus, skills and mechanics that not only do you not need to use, I would say your experience would be adversely affected were you to use them. So if Disco Elysium is a better game, perhaps it is only because of Torment's failings. Zom recognized that if you're going to have skills and abilities in this game where the narrative and world are the focus, then all of them need to be in service to that. If and when there is combat, it's handled the same way the rest of the checks are. Maybe it's a testament to the strength of the game's writing that despite this, I would still absolutely say that Torment is in a storytelling class of its own and worthy of its lasting reverence. There's certainly a literary quality to its writing in that it is not merely an interesting story, but one that wishes to impart something greater with you, a thing that is left to interpretation, a lesson, a question, whatever. But it is still a game that requires your input and changes based on your playstyle. I understand that the combat is not good and probably shouldn't have even been implemented, at least not in that form. But I don't think it's as much of a deal breaker as people make it out to be, or reason enough to pursue some kind of unofficial novelization in place of playing the game. Don't get me wrong, it is not good and mostly exists as this perfunctory guess as to how to render D&D combat into a video game, it's just not offensive and can still be fun if you work to focus on magic use. Also, I don't have a problem with playing a game where combat is just clicking on people. If you've played Diablo, Path of Exile, an RTS game, fuck even World of Warcraft, it's not far removed from that. There's just less reason to exert energy on it. Everyone's afraid to admit that most combat in games is just clicking on heads, and I'm tired of pretending it isn't. I have a bias with the graphic style and quality, wherein I don't know how you look at Planescape and not be charmed by it. Especially now that the Enhanced Edition lets you zoom in and out and enjoy every crusty detail. It's great, the voice acting is pitch perfect, the soundtrack is occasionally quite beautiful and atmospheric, and there is so much rich use of sound. There are some locations I'd just leave open while I wrote, just so I was there, immersed in the Planescape type beats. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. Updated my journal. It's still good. Updated it's still good. Journal. I still like it. <laughs> I still like journal. it. They tried to shut me down, tried to silence me, but the world needs to know that right now you gotta come, come to, to the, the planes. planes because trips to the outer planes come with free hotel accommodations. You hear that? They're banging on the door trying to stop you from taking part in possibly the best deal you're gonna get all year. Included with the price of your ticket, you get exclusive access to a planar hut, nay sweet, constructed from the finest debris, decked out with all the bells and whistles you'd expect from Sigil. The cloudy jewel of the plains. We're talking bed, we're talking nightstand. Need I say more? I couldn't even if I wanted to. Well, it sounds like the door might give way soon. Don't worry about me. I put a virus on their computers. I cyber attack their ass. Before committing to travel arrangements, please take a moment to sign our liability waiver which states that in the unlikely event you become stranded in an extra-dimensional prison or driven insane by a night hag spell, then you did so fully aware of the risks and damages involved and will not seek legal action against this company or any of our subsidiaries. Call now! I do appreciate a good deal. Alright, let's give it a whirl. Survived my, my BDSM club. My, my seven month long birthday massacre concert. You survived 
Man. Man. And to Max Payne. Pain. Pain. And now, Planescape Torment. But listen, Goth Gamer. Torment. The real torment begins now. And now. Two worlds. <laughs> You know, Susie, if you want to recommend a game, you could just DM me. Like, that's fine. The video is over. That is the end of it. Thank you for watching it. If you are a patron or on my Discord, thank you for voting on this game for me to make a video about it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you remain subscribed to me if you already were. Uh, if this was the last straw in some regard, then uh, uh, good riddance. <laughs> but if you haven't, please uh, do all the things that other YouTubers tell you to do at the end of video. You know what they are. I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. And an extra special thanks to... And I've implemented a new way of compiling these, so uh, there may be new errors, or it may have fixed things that were errors before, causing further errors in uh, my notes on them, so... Uh, I'll do my best. Likely not fixed will be any of my mispronunciations. Jesus fucking Christ. I mispronounced the word mispronunciation. See, I, I can't even do my language. How am I going to do Polish or Icelandic? Fuck's sake. Thank you to Password for Kids. Again, Dean. Alex, 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 Alex Raymond, Alexander Smith, Andre Perkins, Aparts89, Bayard Brown, Ben Carnell, Benjamin Sid Pettis, D Sky, Dalton, Danny, DKP, Kilpatrick, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor86, The Illuminati, Diesel Dizzle, Dr. Beard, Dos Days, Edgy, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Gamma, Garrett Gavinis, Gody McGork, J. Alamine, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Kamikaze Melon, Leon Hooks, Lizitar, Lore, Marcus Chani, Morgan Harper, Neck Out the Brave, Octo, Oisto, Philip Woolley, Richard Gillespie, Roland, Salvatore Tosti, Sammy! Ugh. Sorry, I ran into that before I, I knew if I had the energy or not. Ugh. Snapplefish, Stuka Bliat. There is an idea of Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real Bateman, only an entity, something illusory. Look at these film and or literature fans. This deal is getting better all the time. Turts, Zach Bishop, Crash Punk, Daniel Streb, Gaming with Clark Tarp, Giraffa, Catherine Graven, A Hanging Chad, Bang Flank, Brady the Sanity Tax Collector, Brozuf Jones, Cantankerous, Dubs, High Food Court, Ishanji, Mad Monty 98, Morgan Dorian Trius the Betrayer, especially betraying anyone who doesn't like Planescape Torment, Nafiz Hook, Ophelia Fishwife, P Dizzle, Persian Air, Please Stop Treating Player Agency as a Negative, Leaning Left Right Manually isn't a fucking cover system, it's basic movement. Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Technica, That Uninformed Guy, The Brunette Girl from ABBA, Where Am I Help, 410,757,864,530 Gay Cops, Agitated Aunt, Anally Assaults Your, My What? Alistair Stewart, Alexander Ulbrich, Ali G, Andrew Light, Andy Krieger, Atari Steed, Auspicious Whiskers, Beetle Sky, Ben and Kara Dowling, Bishy93, BivDub, Brendan McFadden, Brett Weaver, Colby, Colt of Lita, Dan Colin, David Fromke, David Harpstrike, Dazed Clockwork, Dongs.exe, Yulino7, Fix My Brain, Garrett's Daddy Dilkies. Haley Bobella, Hitoshi san, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, Jun Choi, Jordan Balzano, Joshua David, J Raptor, Captain Ketchup, Kiki Dharma, Leopold Gloom, M, Mandalore Gaming, Marauding Fraud, Max Cohen, MCR, Micah J Best, Miles Phillips, More Sharks, Mr. Ducky Quack, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Hill, Nick Timmins, Nuclear Sun, Noel Rom, Nunu, Oliver Marshall, Opichi Kostra, Paul Fierce, Robert, Ruibi Somem, Samejima, Scarthorax, Lord of the Roaches, Scofflaw D, Skylar J. Leal, Saab Akaduka, Startide, Swood Operator, Team R, The Ratmonger of Castle Jork, Travis Houston, Vincent Cronin, Zanga PF, Stianek Benez, 8 Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, Al, Alec Dye, Alzam, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Ferreira, Andre Kalganov, Angel Jimenez, Anon, Our Attack, Arches Knight, Austin Scott, Barbecue Jr., Beardicus, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Big Honk, Binary Vision, Bindle, Bisexual Buffy Summers, Biddles 999999, Blotherus, 
Blood Clat Mentality, Boris Rombold, Brams, Brendan Naftal, Bug Hall, Buckaroo, Byron Callan, Cabbage, Calavera, Callum May, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Casputin, Cheo Horde, Charles Morgan, Chicken Legs, Jimmy Changa Jones, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Chunky Duncan, Clay Catlin Loves You, Colin Boyd, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Crispy, Delaminac, Dan, Dan Richardson, Dante DeGlanville, Dark Cloud 402, Darkhoff. David Quinn, David Offord, Declan J. Keen, Der Commissar, Devin Rampersad, Devlin Gillespie, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Dreadhead, Drenched, Dry County Blues, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Elizabeth Haste, Ursandro, Exidium JTR, Fazy, Fib Likely, Frodo Ballbag, Frederick, Gay Actor, Michael Douglas, Gecko Jones, Ginevra, George, Greg Buchold, Greg McKee, Gray for Life, Grimby's My Big Baby Boy, Halcyonized Platypus, Euronymous Goa, Hugo, Ian Greer, Ian Laser, INTJ Loves Her, INTP, Evo Zap, J Marshall, Jake Steele, Jared Siri, J Dog, th J Dog, three four three three, Jean Philippe Malouin, Jessica, Jesse Randall, Jim J, J Man DX, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, Jordan, Wabuktis, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Kevin O, Knife Dampier, Chris Odie, KS, Lori, No Debit Card for a Month, Kubri, Lazarna Chekhov, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Leon Holmes, Lewis Gordon, LGX, LL0X, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Million, Mangy Mongrel, Matt F, Max Mo7 Labar, Megan Carmody, Mike. Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Mundane, Q Chan, Nicholas Nelson, Noel M. Nothing beats the taste sensation when maple syrup collides with putty. Nuan Sonar, Oh Heck It's Noah, Olympus 3DX, Omar Eid, Otter Soldier, Patrick Blue, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Fat Murdoch, Piketty, Pizarro, Please Keep Making Videos, Professor Nowitz, Ronin, Rinkara, Robert Jernovsky, Sajus Atchis, Sam Gardner, Savvy Fab, Skoss117, Scott Aldridge, Sean, Sean Clausen, Shadow Man 8, Siegent, Sleepy Poss, Smokey Jefferson, Spaceman Spiff, Spider, Splort Dusky, Seventh of His Name, Spooky, Sugar Wolf, Steinuel, Steph Van Andel, Steve, Strakinya Redenkovich, Subdermal Cassette Loader, Sydney Steverson, T Grim, now random supernatural quote, random character, Semi! One line I think about a lot is in one of the uh, Nazi episodes. Nazis. Nazis. I hate these guys. Terranism, the Deharan, the Fit Hit the Shan, Tindalos, Titan, Toaster Ringtail, Totally Not a Mimic, Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler F, Vel, Waba, Ween Supreme, Wildo, Yak Smiker, Eves Yang, Zachariah, I am, Zin, Zin, Zubertuber, AJ Leroy, AL Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, Adolency, Adrian, Adrian Fachi, Adventure Game Geek, Alexei German, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsonel, Andy Starling, Andre Kurenkov, Andy Bowman, Anno, Anthony Daniel, Aractuary, Eris Alessandrakis, Austin Mathis, Autotroph, Baker, Bent Out of Shape, Big Hubert, Bo, Boop Butt, Brad, Brad Bone, Brandon Corker, Brian Sanson, Brick Dick Rick, BS Fam, B Southby, Captain Swing, Cat Boots, Kaz, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, Clayton, CMG161, Corrine Green, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, Dale Walden, David Moreau, David Sterling, Dizzy Rogue, Doug Robinson, Dylan Clements, Dinah, Earth Go Hard, Ellerick, Fabulous Freckles, Feeder Goldfish, Frank, Freaking Bamboozler, Gamer Cot, Games Brit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, George Costanza, Grimbeard Stole My Credit Card, Gusinder, Half Asian Viking, Hallam, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Helen, Herb Messiah, Hinches, Homeboy Dirtbag, We Lay, I confidently tell potential housemates that I paint Warhammer Orc Goths. If I were to talk about the Saddle Creek Sound game, oh, I don't know what your name means, but I hope you're okay. Ignacio de Guglielmi, Infidel Sawyer, IP68, Isabella Stoner, Jake. Jacob Hanley, Jake Roper, James Sutherland, Jared, Jayak, Jed Grahek, Jeep Pete, Jesse Karchinski, Joe Reynolds, Joe Richardson, Johan Kavand, John, Jonathan Becker, Josh B, Joshua McLarnett, Yoni Niamela, Yuha Kauri, Kakun, Karen Mayville, Kenopsia, Kevin Thurber, Krampic Newt, Laszlo, Lucas, Lucian Jelly, Ludwig, Level Zero, Marshall H, Matthias Waltman, Max Karlaftis, Melly, Me P. Fay, Mr. Mundus, Mop, Mugwuffin, Yargar, Niall McCorkendale, Nicholas Monroe, None, Not a Door Person, Okay Cat Dad, Ombud, Atop. 
Octavio Albanese, Party Over Here, PWs, Pedro Costum, Perennial Astronaut, Boney Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Princess Flumpf, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, Rahul Kirthi, Randa Banana, Resurrection, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Roast Samson, Robert Scotland, Ryan Hollinger, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Sam Myers, Samich, Saturnine 99, Schluff, Schwabalaba, Sean Lees, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sean Rogers, Sean Tiva, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Slava Saknienko, Slavic Dreams, Smokey, Sneaky Beeping, Solar Box, Stephen Laflame, Super Dunman, Sven Grell, Sweet Pete, The Blue Moon Hero, Sinoise, Syraprise, Tatami Guy, Tax Deductible, Test Done, The Gaming Beehive, Little Bee, The Real Kal-El, The Magnificent Spud, There's No Rule Says a Dog Can't Learn to Use a Computer and Donate via Patreon. This is a Certified Hood Classic. Thread, Tim Johnson, V, Val Halverson, Valinora, Berioth, Vinculus, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Wap Bop Alubop Alop Bomb Bomb, Your Patron, Yuko Valis, Zalba, Zero Kind, ZJ, One Iserlo, A Hyami, Acid Buffet, Adam Lindsay, Adrian, Alberto Ferreira Valverde, Alex Army Bull, Alex Spears, Alex Yu, Allegory, Alpaca Omega, Feeder of Blood, Anna Trans Rights XO, Anders Evanrud, Andrew Hagstrom, Andy F, Anna Nuff, Ansi Poikonen, Astro Shepard, As Roy, Bertigan, Basti, Ben E, Benjamin Payne, Bernard Walker, Bertie Bertig, Bertie, Big 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 Far. Party Nuts, Big Death Energy, Big Danger, Big Stupid Grin, Bloodworth, Bobby Campbell, Bobson Jr., Boyi, Bow to the Beard, Brandon Faust, Brandon Harris, Brandon Shock, Bratishka, I Brought You Something to Eat, Cam, Camelopardis, Campbell Gilpin, Cassidy Moser, Chalabar, Chaz Holy Holies, Chef Toker, Chili Dish Gambino, Chonko Ronco, Chris, Chris Barb, Christy Mallory, Chunkus Man Hunkus, Clinton Attaway, Cloyster 56, Colton Rowe, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Dalton Goes Fast, Dan Zin Dandy Alexander, Danny D, Daniel F, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Daniel Pena, Dan Tech K3, Daryl Lai, Daryl Lay, Dave Bojack, David Badzinski, David LaSalle, David Musiel, Dead Alewives, Delta, Damar, Display Name Here, Div, Deveith Faust, Domingo Carlo Martinez, Dr. Tiddlybits, Dust Sucker, Dylan Lash, Edmo Filo, Edward Wheeler, Eggs McOmelet, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leung, Eric Lawn, Erotic Fridge Magnet Poetry, Figley Berserker, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Franciska Dimitrovska, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Fremantle, One Word, Franz, G Braiding, G's, Genuine Chillcast, Gianni Matragrano, Gideon Schubert, Graf Zal, Greyheart, Gribley, Gerlin, Guy, HL Long Girl, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Hofflerand, Holy Molet, HTTPS colon slash 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 u2.be slash pfrlf3ud6po hush vox i fall down ian ian baronek i guess it's time impulse 101 inside my strange place jacob gardner jade partita james burton jb jcl300 jean-philippe simar jick magger joe man john adams john araho john brumley john kamich john stone john z jory avner joseph paulos josh hessler joshua charlton joshua khan joshua stewart jove wardlaw justavian justinus smertina Khalifas, Karate Schnitzel, Carpad, Casey Ghoul, Keenan Smith, Kimia, Kit Tonkin, Kristen Benedbeck, Kirano, Kyle Hooten, Kyle Williams, Lefazar, Laura Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Lee Stone, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinn Whalen, Liam, Low C, Love You More, Lucas Mendel, Luke Gazaway, Lynn Lovett, Mad Morgo, Mad Z, Magno Dick, Manu Weidman, Mara Alina, Matt Clark, Matt Duman, Matt M, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowwood, Maxime Sleepwalker, Mage Win, Murr, Metal Crew, Mia, Michael B, Michael Henderson, Michael Main, Miguel Amaro, Mikey Tambourine, Mohammed Ali, Mojave Jade, Moral, Mungo Jerry, Mustard Sweat, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Negative Creep, Nick Bowl, Nick Johnson, Octo, Oliver Darmody, Uncle, Orlando Murillo, Pagan Butler, Parapug's number one fan? You hear that? Peach, Peachy Pixel 8, Pentagon Black, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Pinky, Piotr Skubawa, Piranot, Pommy, Popeyed Bark, Prod Mage, Pugs Please, Quirky Top Hat, Rachel Rose, Raphael Becker, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, R Damn Dude, Red, Red OKB, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Riley, Replicant, Ruben, Rex Ivan, Robert McMahon, Roosevelt Hoover IV, Rotten Avocado, Ryan Garvey, Ryan Malone, Sabwone, Saint, Sam, Samantha Wells, Sammy 3D, Samuel Albert Mel, Sarah Denman, Scott Balline, Sea Lever, Sean Bradford, Sessio, Seth Flag, Shazbot 101, Shempamite, Snaggy Duck, Sneezing Through Your Butt Leads to Grave Consequences, Soka Death, Someone Finally Pays Me, Space Lizard, Sparkle, Summer Storm, Sweeneasy, System 16, Team Zack Attack.
that one guy, that Taffer, the French Ghosty, this it four, Thomas Caldickery, Thomas Finnegan, Thy Rourke, Timothy, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Tristan Daniels, Soros, Tucker White, Tyler Mindrup, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Valiant Shadow, Van the Cheesen, Vincent Liu, Vlad M, Vukules, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Webgoth, Wudukind, Wilhelm Schroederheim, William Riker, Witch Knight Ren, Wolrek, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yi, Yasarian, Yuki Cyan, Zane Break and Ziklau. For being a patron. Thank you so much for supporting me and my channel and me, more importantly. Quite literally, physically, financially, couldn't do it without you. I'm glad you're here. I uh, hope you're doing all right. I'm going to keep this brief so uh, the video doesn't have to be any longer than uh fuck I'm ruining it fuck I'm just gonna I'm just gonna head out is that okay I just before I did I want you to know how how grateful I was but uh, gonna get to scooting I guess um I want to get a jump on the next video because uh taking so long with this one was an ordeal uh, you, you're great you're amazing thank you again uh bye hey, man.